down that uh, the five to nine. That's great. Yeah, we've got um, 54 uh, LCHU visitors, including our sister city, Vincent. The mayor of Vincent is going to be here. Festival medal. Bruce. Bruce, you have the Alsatian Festival medal. You've got to come to. It's at the Alsatian Festival as the Fiesta medal. <laughs> come Saturday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> got me there. <laughs> Actually, hear me over the microphone now. Still now? I'll turn it down. Okay. I've got to call in too, and they'll be able to run me. Hopefully, it's tomorrow. We'll try to elevate a little bit. Your lady got to sniff front. Okay. Now, now, now we can start the meeting. <laughs> okay. We are late. All right. Uh, we are here for the uh, April 23rd, 2024 regular called cast, uh, council meeting. We're going to open it up at 530. Uh, let's start with the call to order. Gina I mean, uh, Martinez, District 1. Roll call. Just, uh, <laughs> Paul Carrier for District 2. Bill King, District 3. David Mars Jr., District 4. Herb Dyer, District 5. And Darren Schroeder Mayor. We're all here. Uh, please uh, stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance and please remain standing for the invocation. We'll start with the American flag. Sir, your hat. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, the one state, under God, one and indivisible. Uh, 
please remain standing for the invitation. Uh, Scott, would you mind? No. Our dearly Father, we're so very grateful for this opportunity we have to gather together to consider the business of the city. Father, we are grateful for this day of life and for all that thou has given us. We ask uh, peace and harmony. We ask for thy wisdom. And Father, we ask that thou be with those who are suffering, who are afflicted, who are dealing with challenges, uh, medical or physical, mental. Father, uh, bring them healing and help us to see opportunities to bless the lives of those around us. These things we ask for in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Please be safe. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we're going to open up citizens' comments in just a moment. Um, Scott wanted to make an announcement about some of the struggles that we've been having with the live stream, so please. Sure. So Helen Delavan, if you're listening, and anyone else, because um, I know she's been very uh, consistent about letting me know when we have issues. So we think we've kind of worked out what the, the bug and cause is. We switched from fiber because ComZoom sold to Spectrum and they discontinued the fiber, ser fiber service that we had built out to the city facilities. We had an option to build new fiber because that's what Spectrum said would be required to all of our facilities, but it was going to cost the city $85,000 to build out that fiber. We looked at building our own fiber loop, but at about the same time, uh, Rise Broadband started what they're doing in the city of Castroville. And so uh, we will have fiber to all, all of our facilities once RISE finishes their work. That should be by the end of this year, beginning of next, sometime in that time frame. If sooner, great, but that's probably a realistic time frame. Unfortunately, for the time being, we are on Spectrum Coax, and we have a gig of internet for our download, but our upload is limited to 35 megabytes, and that's it. And so we believe, we, we've, we've, we've basically tested every other theory we believe that is what is happening to our live stream. It's trying to upload, and once it hits that, that threshold, it, it kaputs, it, it quits on us. So I'm working with, right now, working with Spectrum to look at bringing fiber just to City Hall to see, uh, see one, what will the build time be, right? If they can get out to us in the next four weeks, and then what the cost is. And depending on that, I'll have a conversation with the mayor and potentially the council about doing that as a, as a temporary fix. Unfortunately, once we pay for that build, we're kind of stuck with that service for at least for this location for 36 months. That's the minimum time frame that we'd have to be, be on that service. But ju just for comparison, when we were with ComZoom, we had 100 megabytes down, download and 100 me megabytes upload, and that was sufficient. So it's, <laughs> we, you wouldn't expect us to have this problem with 35 megabytes, but it's just not enough. So. That's what's going on. Uh, hopefully, it won't continue to be a problem, but that uh, we believe that's probably what's happening. Yeah, that's we'll, shorter meetings, right? Hmm? Yeah, that's shorter, shorter meetings. meetings yeah. uh, no, it's uh, <laughs> it's the total amount that's going at any one time. But yes, I think that the answer is shorter meetings. <laughs> and talk slower. <laughs> talks no faster. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so now let's open up citizens' comments. Would anybody like to speak for citizens' comments? Please. If I remain, uh, I think everybody knows the rules here. That's fine. Everybody's good here. Oh, uh, Melton Tice, Castroville, Texas. Uh, I just want to bring it up again about the. Sorry, Junior. Could you, uh, for for the record, could you state your address as well? We need to make sure that we record that. I'm sorry. I think Say your name and address. 1115 Madrid. Thank you. On the corner where all the flags are at. <laughs> um, I'd like to bring it up again about the golf courts and the ATVs. I know our chief and his men are watching things very close because it is getting bad. There's kids driving them around now by themselves, and that's uncalled for. That's just one thing. Another thing I noticed, we've got one of the prettiest parks in the country. I helped with them that time when it was built, and there's been a lot of good functions down there. And I went to one the other day, didn't even know what was going on. There was only about 100 people down there with three bands playing. This needs something to be done. We got a park, let's use it. The Chamber of Commerce, I don't even know if they knew about it. I don't even know if it was advertised. 
But let's put something into that part too instead of one or two things. It's very pretty. Let's use it. And I, the chamber, will help with it. That's all I got to say. Great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Would anybody else like to speak for citizens' comments? My name is Bruce Alexander. I live at 516 Vienna Street. And I'm here tonight to speak in opposition of the sale of the natural gas system to provide the, the election that's going on right now that would provide City Council the authority, if passed, to sell the system. You know, I'm going to take part a little bit about last week's meeting some information that otherwise wouldn't have been exposed or told people. This city knew in July of 2022 that CPS was wanting out of the contract. They renewed the contract in September of 2022 with one year and two six month extensions. That's 18 months ago, that's two budget cycles. Would have given you plenty of time to find the material, to train the people, to have your staff take care of it. Last week showed that you made a net of $256,000, I believe, last year. Average over $200,000 net on the gas system, even paying CPS, which is currently, what, $180,000 a year contract, still making that type of a profit on it. $180,000 will pay for your employees, okay? And you can get those employees qualified through going through training at the Railroad Commission. Look it up online. Don't cost much. I know that's how I got qualified 40 years ago. Same qualifications are there. Okay? So the failure for the city to act 18 months ago, or over the past 18 months, it's kind of like the story, the, fail for the, the, the emergency created by your failure to act does not constitute an emergency on my part. So maybe later I might change my position if we were told all the information. Because I'm going to go back again. In September of 2022, Mr. Dixon reported to the council that we're going to give our engineer a look at it and have him give us an assessment. Where is that assessment? It hasn't been shared with the public. We have no idea what that assessment is. In December of 2013, the minutes reflect that Mr. Dixon came and asked the city council to approve $76,000. $76,000 to replace pipeline. Mr. Dyer asked if it was a one year thing or every year thing. It was. So you approved the money to upgrade the system in December. Then we come along in January and Mr. Dixon says, it's a million dollar cost to the city to operate the system. These are in public records. Then in February, February 13th, as a matter of fact, Mr. Dixon said, it's $500,000 to operate it. And that's when you pass the ordinance to call for the election. My question back to see, and, and at that point, Mr. Dyer referenced there'd be two public hearings. To my knowledge, there's never been a public hearing to tell the people what's going on. We had a special meeting last week, but there's not been anything. So there's, there's not been a lot of information shared to the public, and we're being asked to vote on something that we don't know about. So I would implore everybody I know to vote against it at this time. Put it back to the city, say, make it work. And then we can look at it again later if it doesn't work. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to speak for citizens' comments? My name is Mickey Holdshouse. I live at 514 Washington with my wife. I'd like to talk about the gas uh, meeting last week. Uh, and for the record, I don't have gas service to my home. My home is all electric. So personally, I don't have any skin in the game uh, with the service per se, but uh, based on the little information that we have uh, with, the, with the system generating a net profit of over $250,000 a year net, if that system is sold, um, then that revenue would be 
just continued and would probably have to be made up somewhere else in the utility budget. So uh, that could take the form of increased rates of other utilities, tax rate going up, et cetera. So even though I don't have gas service to my home, I think I'll be impacted by the decision that's made. I'm glad to see that the council is uh, going to at least give the public an opportunity to weigh in on this, whether it be yes or no, uh, knowing that even if it's yes, you still don't have to sell it. I understand that. Uh, what a, what a, you know, the, the presentation by Mr. Pena, uh, whether he put it together or it was a collaboration with the city, was actually, I thought, very, very informative. And he was very knowledgeable and answered the questions that, was, that were asked. I, I commend him for that. Uh, if you compare that presentation, and the slides were all legible, print was big, we understood it. If you compare that to any of the presentations that we've had from the Simple City Group, it's head and shoulders above of what they have attempted to provide us as citizens. A uh, couple of questions I have, and, and I know that the, the, the questions we could ask and couldn't last week were limited, but one of the questions I have is, what's the valuation of the system? Number one, as is. Two, uh, we learned that West Texas Gas is the supplier of gas to the city of Casterville, not city public service. City public service is the, we're under, under contract with them for operation and maintenance. So that was great to know. And I know that Mr. Dixon pointed out it was on the website, but uh, let's face it, not everybody looks at the website and that information could and should have been volunteered. So uh, my question, the, the question comes then, and I wish I could have asked it that night, but I couldn't think fast enough, was, we already are buying the gas from West Texas Gas. We're contracting for operation maintenance for city public service. Who else is out there that we could contract with for operation and maintenance? Are there other people? I would think there are. And have we made an attempt to solicit proposals? And when you solicit proposals, I hope that if we get to the point where it's going to be sold, that we get somebody qualified to do this because, you know, if I compare it to the bannering we had a couple of meetings ago about the streets and Mr. Dixon and Mr. King had about river rocks and some cut, cut some in citizen uh, using some derogatory comments to Mr. King because the, as you mentioned, using your words, uh, because the street wasn't any good. You know, a question takes me back to, well, who's the engineer on the project? Who wrote the, who wrote the specifications? Uh, was anybody held accountable for that? We hope that, you know, accountability is a big deal, and the, or the lack of, I should say. Uh, my three minutes are almost up, but I'd like to end with that. Uh, I know that uh, there's some discussion, rumors, that the city yard may be moved, uh, the property may be sold, it may be donated. I don't know to what extent any of those comments are true. But I'd like to give uh, each council member and, and uh, the administrator a copy of the minutes from August 14, 2013, when there was a public hearing uh, in these chambers. I don't believe anybody was on the council at that time. So this will be informative for you to know what, was, what happened at that meeting and that the yard was going to be moved at that time. Uh, I don't want to cut you short. You are out of time. If you could send that to them, I appreciate you. I have that it up. right here. Perfect. If Thank you. Pass one down, and I'm sure it will be informative. Hopefully, the citizens of this community will be given the benefit of a, of a public hearing and perhaps a vote of whether we should or should not move the city yard and what should be done with the property. Because there's implications from Simple City that uh, they're already going to build buildings on that place from some of their drawings. And by the way, I still believe that Simple City, uh, that contract should be terminated and you should cut your losses. It's a, it's a travesty to spend the money with, uh, with those people for their ineptness. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to speak for citizens' comments?
Tam Alexander, 516 Vienna Street. I just want to point out, this is incorrect. Mr. Murs is the number four, not Harold Stein. And so, I just want to point that out. Thank you. All right, would anybody else like to speak for your citizens' comments? I have one of my constituents sent me something they would like for citizens' comments. Please, uh, can you state the name and address? Yep. Right, right here. Thank you. For Mr. John G. Wernett, 2238 U.S. Highway 90 West, he said he has, to whom may concern, Ruth Curry Lawler coined the phrase used as the subject line of this message. Ms. Lawler was a shaper of history in our community of Castroville. As she considered her legacy, she chose to give her beloved Landmark Inn to the state of Texas. It is now Landmark Inn State Historic Site. It lies across present day U.S. Highway 90 from September Square. The location used by the first Alsatian settlers on their arrival at what would evolve into present day Castroville. The history is in jeopardy as future plans for Highway 90 develop. There appear to be two proposals. To develop a bypass around Castroville, effectively removing Highway 90 from the city of Castroville. And the other is allowing U.S. Highway 90 to remain at its, at its present location, bisecting the city of Castroville. As a retiree of, the tech, of TxDOT, I believe some of the history of my career is relevant to this issue. My career began as an employee in the engineering office at Bernie, Texas. At the time, I-10 was in the process of development in Kendall County. By design, it was located to the west of Bernie, effectively sparing the historic city from the effects of the development that would become an interstate highway carrying traffic across the United States. Later in my career with TxDOT, took me to the engineering office at Hondo, from where construction of I-35 was being coordinated. This construction spared the towns of Lytle, Natalia, and Devine from development by effectively bypassing the three towns to the east. Unfortunately, this was not the case for Highway 90. It was routed directly through historic Castroville, effectively destroying the configuration of the city streets as surveyed by John James, the original surveyor of Castroville. It is not possible to correct the historic error done in Castroville by removing Highway 90 from the city of Castroville in favor of a bypass route around the historic city. In the interest of preserving the ambience of the city of Castroville, please consider developing a bypass around the city of Castroville as the most viable alternative. Thank you for your consideration in this matter. John G. Burnett. All right, thank you. Uh, a couple Before we close this out, I, I wanted to ask uh, city staff a couple of points of clarification, and please uh, keep me in line if, if I'm asking this correctly. Um, so one of the questions was, or one of the statements was, that in July 2022, we knew about CPS getting out of the contract. I, can you clarify that statement, please, what we learned in July of 2022? Yeah, I need to go back and review my notes. I was sitting there thinking as Mr. Alexander was speaking, um, my recollection of the events was that, that we re they renewed for a one-year contract in part because they were saying they needed to go up by 50% on their cost. We renegotiated to 13%, and it wasn't until about 30 days or whatever the time period was before the end, whatever that, the, the legal time frame was, the end of that first period of the contract that we found out that they weren't, gonna, they weren't intending to renew. So it's not that we've known for 18 months. I think we've known more like for about nine, eight or nine months, about half that time. Of course, we've been working on, we knew when, when they gave us a one-year contract that we, at that point, we did start to explore um, whether one, could we find another operator? Uh, because again, they were hitting us with an operator cost that was so, nearly double. Yeah, so Have I answered? Okay. 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 Um, you know what? Let's do. So I'm going to move my item 11 
up to item number 10. We've got a couple of quick items and uh, I want to make sure that we get to those and we've got our consultant here, so let's address that and then we'll come back to these, all right? Are we skipping on consent agenda to no. the last? No, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the, because these should be some fairly quick, one, yes. quick ones uh, right before our consultant, so I want to make sure that we uh, do that. Okay, so the next item is consent agenda. Uh, on the consent agenda, we have minutes for April 9th, 2024, regular call to city council meeting. Uh, we have approved Medina Valley Soccer Association contract. We have proclamation for Building Safety Month, May 2024, and we have uh, adopt a resolution ratifying the prior authorization and creation of Castroville East Side Public Improvement District Number Two. Do I have a, a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda. Great. Do I have a second? A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? I, I was going to ask to have B hold the side because I have a question. Okay, uh, would uh, Councilman Dyer, would you consider removing B from your uh, motion? Re removing D? B. B. Certainly, if that's what she okay. wants to do. And uh, Councilman Carey, would you be amenable to that as your I am. second? Yes. Okay, so we are going to remove a pr uh, item B. So I have a motion and a second for A, C, and D. Uh, I'd like to have a vote again. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? The motion passes. Next item is approved Medina Valley Soccer uh, Association contract. Uh, and I'll open it up for discussion right away. Okay. My only question is, is I didn't see what fee they were going to be paying to the city. Unless I'm skipping it totally. That was $25 a person. Because I know yes. their season already started up. Yeah, it's based on their attendance, on the number of kids they have. And I think, I think that direct. follows our... <coughs> We have a, uh, a per person for all of the events at the regional park. I think it follows that same under our master fee schedule. Isn't that correct? I uh, can't say it definitively because I, I think there may be like the beach league. I'm not sure if we charge them a per person or per season. Um, I thought it was $25. Uh, no, it's $20, $20 per participant. Okay. That is I rental see, fee. See per participant. All right. Yeah. So, page three. I could so we they don't pay us until after the red it's after the red closing of registration and so what kind do we give them like 30 days if they don't meet the four weeks after registration or what kind of leeway leeway do yeah, we give are we giving or are we at four weeks what, what kind of leeway would you like us to give them I mean, do you have a I don't know how prompt they are in paying. I don't know their payment history in the past. She said that they, they have to pay no later than four I, weeks following close of registration. Yeah, I see that, but if they don't meet that suspense, Mr. What? Mayor, I got a comment. Okay. So the question uh, from uh, Sheena is mm -hmm. if they don't pay on time, what is the penalty? Councilman Dials had a. The, the process. For the parks at the park board when they do these contracts uh, first of all our our goal is not to make a big profit our goal is to provide a service uh, we try to keep the per person cost as low as possible in order to allow the maximum number of people to participate the actual exchange and payment to the city is very fluid usually before the first game they have gotten paid for every participant okay. normally that's the way it normally is because they got to know how many teams they got to know how many players so usually they will have identified how many players they're going to be and what the revenue is going to be and we usually get that revenue either immediately before or very close after the first game okay so the four weeks is the it's, cut off it's if, kind of if, fluid if, i don't yeah. think there's anybody counting oh, well I know we were during our audit the uh, auditor said that we had a couple of things that slipped through the cracks and mm -hmm. I was just making sure that we're keeping on top of things this time okay with our contracts okay thank you Good. yeah <coughs> for the questions on that yeah and item okay. <coughs> and item 12.1 it it reads 
either the city or Medina Valley Soccer Association, with or without cause, may cancel this agreement by giving 45 days prior written notice thereof to the other Medina Valley Soccer Association. That seems like there's something to each other I could see, but it, to the if you understand, there's a mm -hmm. typo there. Okay. And then, but then it goes. What is the typo? Well, it says thereof to the other Medina Valley Soccer Association. Uh, it should be struck. Yeah, but yeah. You, that probably needs just to be stricken. And then, but then it goes on and says, if this agreement is canceled without cause by the city, the city shall pay the Medina Valley Soccer Association the prorated cost connection with and contributed to the cancellation of the agreement approved and authorized by the city. It, so up above it says with or without cause, mm -hmm. and then without cause, and then it puts back in if there is a cause, then we have to refund it back. It just seems kind of a funny wordage there. But it can be canceled with or without cause, but if you do it without cause, there's a stipulation. Yeah. So maybe yeah, that's so the okay. idea is, I mean, I just think about it this way. So the idea is if we cancel their contract without cause, they have done anything wrong, but we decide if, because maybe it's the interest of the fields or the city council says, you know what, we're closing that and building an amphitheater there. I don't, I don't know. But if there's a reason that, that we have to cancel that contract, then what we're saying is we agree to pay you the per rata of the amount of money that uh, use that you did not get on those fields for that season, where the remainder of the season is. That's why it's in there. I think it's us holding ourselves accountable to not burning right. the. I mean, this is all about the youth sports. This is all about taking care of. Now, the if they sports. cancel on us, we yeah. keep the funds either way because we maintain the fields, et cetera. But okay. But I think there is that typo that you probably yeah. need to strike no, that out. Yeah. Okay. So correcting the wording. In twelve point one, striking Medina Valley Soccer Association. All in all caps. <laughs> okay. Do I have a motion to approve with the stated modifications? So moved. Great. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. So that's five minutes on you guys. <laughs> ask them beforehand. That's good. I mean, it's good. It's better, it's better to ask it now than not at all, but it's better, even better to ask it ahead of time so we have that answer before the meeting. Uh, not that I am ever not guilty of wasting five minutes. Okay, next item is uh, presentation uh, and recognition of uh, Brian Beck, winner of the 8th Annual Poppy Poster Contest. Obviously, I'm not Brian Beck, but Arnie DeLossi from CADC. Mr. Beck was going to be here. I've texted and called him both since I've been sitting here and have gotten no response. So we would like to postpone this to a future <coughs> council meeting. Sounds good. We'll Thanks. do that. Thank you. Oh, Thank Brian you. is okay. Yeah. Do you need any action on that? No, we'll, we'll postpone that. And uh, it's just going to be in recognition. It's best if he's here, yeah. so that's good. And I do want to point out poppy posters have been put on the wall inexpertly, but they're up there. I don't know. I think you did a pretty good job. And there's space for the next one. So. Cool. And Pat, when did you start this? Because you, you, you started this eight years ago. Eight years ago and has been hard and fast with Arnie on this that entire time, doing a great job and providing some great uh, uh, prizes for our kids and adults alike. And it's grown from, what was it initially? Uh -huh. And Thank you for doing that. Thank you. All right, next item is the city administrator report. Okay. Scott, is there anything you wanted to call out specifically? Yeah, there's a couple items that I want to mention. One was the um, pool entry, beach entry. I want to clarify, so um, 
I went back and looked, and in, in the report is the original um, photographs that were submitted as part of that item. I think there was kind of a, I forget what the, the term is, there's a psych, psychological term when everybody agrees that they think they heard one thing, but it act, when you go back and listen to the recording, it actually wasn't said, that kind of thing. Um, when we looked at the beach entry, I, uh, I think we all assumed, myself included, that it would be a beach entry with no step, like it would just be a constant a slant or slope. And that is not the case. It will it will terminate in some in some submerged steps. Now it's still a beach entry. It still is ADA compatible. It still does all other things. But the fact of the matter is that there is it's, it'll be 28 feet of drop. So by the time you get to the end of the of that ramp, you'll be standing in about two feet of water. Um, and then you'll take two steps down, and when you're at the bottom of that step, you'll be in about 30 inches of water, or 30 to 36 inches of water. Um, so that's the way this, this is being built, and it is already being demoed, it is being built out, but I wanted to clarify that. I know uh, uh, Councilman Murray's had some concerns. I will say that, that the ultimate design, this type of design with submerged steps, has been used in a number of other municipal pools, um, and as far as the ultimate, kind of like, the, the outcome that we're looking for, a place where young, where, where people who were non-ambulatory could get into the pool and a place where uh, especially young mothers with their kids could kind of sit and, and play in a beach-like environment. Of course, we don't have the wave machine or anything like that, but they can be in that shallow water with the umbrella. All of that it will be achieved by this design. So we're achieving what we set out to do. That's great. And I've heard some really good positive feedback from Helen, who's always looking out for this as well. Did you have, hear anything else from the park board? Councilman Dyer, did you have uh, a comment? I, I don't want to talk about the parks board because I'm not on it anymore. Okay. Dave is. All right. He wanted to say something. I just wanted to express an opinion. I think the confusion came about because we were discussing in the city council meeting getting rid of the lift if we, mm -hmm. if we had beach access and we would be able to, people could go in in a wheelchair without having to use the lift. However, it, it was never clear to me that there were steps. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to go on the record and say, I think we need a buoy rope and some signs to make it very clear to anybody who's in the beach entrance that there is steps up there. Mm -hmm. Because somebody in a wheelchair goes down there and there's no indication in the water they go, they're gonna fall out. So well, I, don't I think a buoy rope and a sign that says steps ahead or something that makes it clear that the beach entrance is coming to an end. That's the only concern I have. Okay, I don't think people are actually entering the pool in a wheelchair. Right. I, I'll have to verify that. But what the, the chair lift allows them to sit in that chair that's in the, you know, it's a pool chair and it lowers them over. So the chair lift is planned, I think I put this in my report, we plan to leave that in place until it makes sense not to leave it. The ADA um, entrance is compliant um, one of the things that we're looking at is, and, and I think we're going to install later if it's net needed, which would be a handrail when you get to those steps or in that general vicinity. We don't think there's a rail needed all the way down the thing, but, but when you get to that point, it may be helpful to have rail. But we're going to kind of play that by, by ear, and if it needs to be done, we'll do it at a later, at a later time. Uh, I'm not too concerned about the rail. Yeah. My concern is a person is not aware of their steps. Right. And they suddenly fall down the steps, they're at great risk. I think there needs to be a clear marker in the water floating, a rope with buoys in it all the way across, mm -hmm. with a sign that says, caution, steps ahead, so that people can see that the, they're gonna fall. Yeah, I get, okay. I, well, I guess, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, I, I okay. think that we just, we need to, uh, you don't want to cut off the, that's a, like putting a, a line in front of the entrance, but I think that there's something that we can yeah. do to make sure that people are aware of that. Okay. We're, we're prepared to make gonna, adjustments as necessary if we need to. Okay. I was going to say that the presence of a handrail would indicate that there's something, I mean, the angle of the handrail and such would indicate that there's a change of grade there. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Um, what did you say? Did you talk about a handrail? Uh, I, Okay, so please speak up. Thank you. That's a comment I was going to make. The presence of a handrail would indicate that there's a change of grade for anyone approaching the steps. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And I'll just remind council and myself, let's make sure that we speak up until we can get the audio thing fixed. Thank you. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, thank you. Talk louder. I, I got you. <laughs> you have that calm and soothing voice. So, uh, 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 just a couple other things to report. Uh, the stormwater improvements, we're going to hear from Samco tonight about issuing drainage related debt. We have a drainage utility. Uh, the debt for that utility was paid, was paid off in 2023. And we're going to talk about issuing new debt and the amount of debt that we may be able to issue. That would be used principally to go and repair and maintain the improvements that were put in in 2002. So the, uh, and we've talked about this a couple different times. So at the next meeting in May, um, he, uh, Mark will talk about the Mark McClain will talk about the uh, calendar on his item. But at the next meeting, in addition to whatever he's going to talk about as far as next steps uh, with the debt issuance, if you choose to pursue that, we will have a presentation from K Freeze uh, that will talk about the, sp the specific project that we would then go and start engineering and and get bids for. Um, but we already have kind of a preliminary estimate and that's in our master drainage plan and it's just in under the maintenance items on Garcia Creek. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to email me and I'll, I'll share what I know. Um, the other item I wanted to mention was uh, the twinning ceremony. Um, what is that? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, the twinning ceremony. Uh, that is this Sunday at 6 p.m. Uh, there is a flyer out there in uh, the main hall of City, of City Hall. Uh, it's a yellow uh, flyer that talks about all the different events that are happening. On Sunday at noon, or Saturday at noon, is the um, kind of a, a, a walk-up meet and greet uh, here at the, what, what are they calling that? The, the yard. yard. The yard. The yard on Paris Street. Uh, so that'll be an opportunity to meet some of the folks that have come all the way over from Alsace, and then those same folks will be at the Alsatian Festival uh, that later that evening starts at four o'clock. Uh, so four until uh, everybody goes home, and then uh, again on Sunday, I think the next activity would be the six o'clock twenty five or five o'clock twenty. Yeah. Thanks. Five o'clock. And the chamber put it out uh, accidentally as six o'clock. It is five o'clock. Five o'clock will be the official ceremony. And that's at Houston Square, right? That is at Houston, Houston Square. Square. Yeah, It'll be right in front that's of the good. church. We're going to block off some, some area for uh, that event, set up chairs, et cetera. Um, so that's that. And I Mayor, think that we're talking about, unless council has an issue with it, for the, the meet and greet on, um, on Saturday, uh, blocking off from Fiorella to Lorenzo, just that one little stretch basically from uh, the Pear Street Flower Shop to um, uh, Blue Lacey. Just because there will be people that will be going back and forth. And on Paris? Block off Paris? Yeah, just blocking off Paris right okay. there. On we'll put up. Okay, Saturday afternoon. Right. We'll put up in the next probably two days, we'll put up little signs on there just to remind people uh, that they may have to go a block around if they wanted to go to any of those. But it just keeps people safe for uh, pedestrian traffic. Okay. Um, that's it for the comments that I have from my report. There is. Um, in the PD report later, uh, there are some items there that we may want to discuss, but that will be under the, the staff reports. Um, Mayor, you had questions about the gas election. I think it would be better to ask those questions now than during the presentation. Is that right? Um, we can do it either way. Yes? yes. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to the, the initial question I think that you answered about what <clears throat> what we knew in July of 2022, uh, and then you started talking about what happened from there. Yeah, so from there, uh, again, staff, when we, I mean, the first thing that hit us was a cost increase, uh, a pretty significant cost increase. So from that point, we started looking at other options, and we've been looking at other options, and to um, Mr. Holzhouse's comment, yes, you know, we were talking to other operators. We, had, we were unable, unsuccessful, to find another operator to take over in CPS's absence. So uh, the short answer to that is there's not an operator that can do everything that CPS was doing. We have reached out to the uh, CPS uh, contractors in that group and have found several that would be able to do brake fix and, and those types of things. But we don't, and we have some cost estimates of what that could cost. Um, so when staff you know, is throwing out these numbers of $500,000, $750,000, a $1 million, um, those figures are related to, to our best 
best guess if we had to do everything internally and had to buy new equipment and start all from scratch. But obviously, if this election you know, uh, results in the city not being allowed to sell the system, then staff is going to do what it always does, which is try to find the most frugal way to do to manage the gas system. Well, I just and, wanted to bring you back in a little yeah. bit. So um, one of the comments was um, we had discussed in December about the $76,000. Very specifically, that was for the 10% of the metal pipe that was in the ground, right? 8%, 8 and it was 16 service lines. And that was, again, uh, that's that was a CPS project that they brought to us and said, hey, our, our, the Railroad Commission did an audit. And we, there, there was an oops. We had not done the, the annual maintenance required. And um, we need to get it done, like now, before the end of January. So it was a mer kind of an emergency situation where we needed to comply with the results of the RRC audit. And we needed to do a project. And they helped us uh, gen up, if you will, engineer a project that would satisfy uh, our requirement. And that's what we did. And that, that was the cost, the $76,000. Now, we actually haven't paid that yet. Um, we haven't received the bill from CPS for that work. Uh, but that was the cost estimate for the work that was to be completed. And then the $500,000 from February was a continuation of that to finish that out. Is that correct? No. Because I, I, really I don't know what $500,000 is about. Uh, there's no, I mean, we. I think we had talked yeah. about the, as we, as we play that out over the 100% of the, the pipe that we needed to replace over the next, whatever, 10, 11 years. Um, I think that was that was probably much more than that. I would Yeah, I have no idea. I, honestly, no, you know, we, we don't know how much. So we know the general idea of how old the pipe is. It's about 60, 65 years. That's 70% of the pipe is steel-coated pipe. Um, you know, how long that pipe lasts, I know Phil was asking, how long does it last? I really don't know. I, I, it, well, where was the pipe manufactured? What kind of ground is it in? How wet has that ground been? You know, what kind of corrosion has taken place? I, I just don't know. Um, but um, we do know it's fairly old, right? Um, as far as the value of the system, um, the way I think someone asked, you know, well, what is our system worth? Um, that's a little diff more difficult question to answer because the way that they, according to Simon Pena, our, our consultant on this project, the way they value gas systems, and this is partly required by like, like the Railroad Commission, um, they dictate the valuation methodology for buying a gas system. And so, the, so even when you're purchased, the purchaser has to justify its cost. It's a little bit like getting an appraisal from a bank, if you think about it that way. Like, you're, you're how you can't just pay whatever you want if it's going to be financed. Um, you have to be able to justify that. And even though this might be a private party buying it, maybe they're not going to borrow any money at all. That's the closest analogy I can use to kind of like the similarity, is that you you have to have a justification for what you buy it for. That's the way Simon Payton uh, described it. And he said that justification and the requirement is it's based on your book value of the system. Well, guess what we don't know in Casterville? Book the book value of the system. And, and it, if we knew the book value, even if we were keep tracking it, there is a very strong likelihood that the, that the book value of the um, installed pipe, the gas pipe that's 65 years old, would be completely depreciated because there's a depreciation window for that, and it's not 65 years. The other, it, to the degree that some of that pipe has been replaced over time, and there's been poly installed and some of other stuff, I can give some, I have some general ideas about the, the especially the stuff that's been built more recently. Um, so for instance, uh, the, the new subdivision of Country Village built out a gas system dedicated to us. We know what that's, that portion of the system costs, about $250,000. So. We can get at some of the book value, but these are some of the things that um, you know, staff has been working to get answers to. And you know, one of the things that's really hampered us is not having our own records. Like um, we've been relying so heavily on CPS for all of this for since 2008 that most of those records have been held by by CPS. And they've been. I want to be clear, CPS, despite the cost increase, which you know, my best estimate, I think that's it's it's. Uh, justified what they're trying to look to recoup because as far as I can tell they've been operating at a loss for at least 10 years um, so uh, I just want to say that you know CPS has been a very very good partner through all this they've really tried to help us get in the information we needed etc but it still hasn't been easy you know we're we're playing catch-up 
I think those are the questions that I heard asked that, uh, again, we genuinely want to try to answer. Um, but we're trying to be careful because, uh, again, as I shared at the last meeting, and I'll share again tonight, you know, our struggle is to stick with things that are fact-based and not make suppositions. And we certainly don't want to come under fire by anybody that thinks we're trying to paint the worst possible picture. Um, we, yeah, we aren't doing that at all. Yeah, I just we're, wanted to clarify some, some things that yeah. are on here, and I think that we'll get into some of the other uh, we'll talk about some of the other questions and concerns uh, further on in this. Uh, so the only, only other thing, I think, um, well, I want to make a point of clarification. This was not, I don't believe this was wholly untrue, but the tax rate going up because well, you know, of the cost of the, um, the, the gas system. I, I think because we have the separation between the enterprise and the general. It, it's not the tax rate. It, 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 it's utility rates. And I think that's a very astute observation yeah. uh, that, that Mr. Holzhaus made. The issue that we don't know is that's the, the, the assumption there is that we're going to be able to carry forward a $250,000 profit each year in, in future years. And I think that is highly unlikely. I think what, what may happen, we'll just see, right? If we end up managing the system ourselves, a first year will be very telling. What does it cost to outsource the break fix? What does it cost to outsource the... Um, bookkeeping and the other aspects that CPS were doing for us. We have some of those, we have rough estimates of some of those costs, and the rough, the total of those rough estimates right now is at least $250,000. Okay. So, and we can get into more of the details yeah. in the presentation. So I think at I best, it would be a wash, way. but more than likely, we'd have to go up on our rates. Okay. More than likely. All right. So if we have other questions related to what you just been talking about, well, I think that anything we'll wait yeah, I'll, I'll anything about now. discussion about the gas system? I think this is just part of part of the city administrator's report was clarifying some some uh, okay. statements that weren't fully accurate during the citizens' comments. So I just wanted to make sure that we clear that up. We'll have a discussion once we get into that item, okay. which we're moving up. Okay. Any other uh, questions on the city administrator report or anything else you wanted to cover? Yeah, I had one question for Scott. Scott, since you all's presentation to us on the community center, nothing's changed on that as far as. There's been no, the, the, the price is still fixed. The demolition well, and, the, and the construction cost is all within the number you gave us earlier, and there's been no major changes to. No, well, I mean, we won't know until we take it out for bid. And um, the plans are, are were made live today, um, but our budget right now is $300,000, or 300, $300 per square foot, and that includes the exterior bathrooms. Now, just as a reminder, those exterior bathrooms have to be covered uh, separately that you can't use the USDA funds that we're putting in four hundred fifty thousand dollars of the city funds so that's what that will go to but again we'll see I, I think I shared with council in the past uh, we had a little bit of streets money left over not enough to really do any any robust street projects and my suggestion to you all is to kind of keep your powder dry let's wait and see how this community center project comes out what the kinds of bids we get and whether we need additional funds we do have a couple of ad alternates so for instance we have the uh, landscaping it's not an ad alternate but we've asked them to bid that separately we have um, all of the the commercial kitchen stuff we have them bidding that as a, a separate line item in case we decide you know what we're gonna do owner, owner furnished or owner installed on that um, so some of the areas where we feel like we could step in and do it um, if we had to value engineer something we try to build that in the bids. It'll be easier to carve those out and do compare it side by side comparisons for the bidders. But as far as major changes to what you last saw, of course you know we've been having meetings every single week to to flesh out various aspects. No major changes. Um, I think you know we had a fenced in back porch when last we met. Um, that's yeah. So I mean, there's been some subtle changes that we've run into and in, in required, but nothing major. Um, Any other questions nope. on the uh, administrator report, or is there anything else you wanted to highlight? Uh, not this time. Like I said, I'm going to reserve. When we get the staff reports, I can remember, and the chief's here, so I'm <laughs> I may let him respond to some of the, the issues that are in his report. But I wanted to uh, talk about the stop signs, the other stuff he reported on. Great. All right, next item is presentation by Samco Capital Markets, the city's financial advisor, with discussion on the possible issue of certificates of obligation for certain drainage improvements and authorizing staff and consultants to proceed with the issuance. Thank you. My name is Mark McLeod. I'm with Samco Capital Markets. We're the city's financial advisor. 
Uh, Jack McClaney is with me. It's our new associate with the firm. Um, and you are related. And we are related, yes. Um, and we're also very active in Castorville. Uh, love being here. I think town looks great. Um, so we're really proud just to be uh, working with you and, and representing you. Um, Scott did a really good job of kind of briefing you a little bit on what's going on with the drainage, what projects you have. Y'all have had a good history of drainage fee coming into the city. It roughly brings in right now about $100,000 a year. Um, and you have some projects that need some improvements there. So I did two things. We've had, visited with some of the local banks and, and there's interest in buying this. This is the annual debt service schedule. Right now it's at four and three quarters interest rate. I think we would do better than that. The far right hand column you can see is basically $100,000. We could borrow, you can go right down there to the bottom, a million three uh, if that's our, our revenue, $100,000 a year. So we're comfortable with that, not taxing more, or in this case it's a drainage utility, not using more than what's been historically coming in. We have a nice reserve already in the drainage utility. So the city's comfortable in that position. If you all want to proceed, the avenue to go forward is a certificate of obligation. We don't want to come to you and say, here, the certificate of obligation, your first legal step is a notice of intention. We want to come here and visit with you, give you opportunity to discuss it, and then if you want us to proceed, you'll see on the timetable, we will come back in your next meeting, May 4, or the May 14th meeting, to authorize the notice of intention resolution. Councils that you've done this before, notice of intention resolution is your notice to your citizens that you intend to borrow an amount not to exceed whatever we decide uh, and support it by ad valorem taxes and drainage utility revenues. That gets published in the legal paper and put on your website and roughly speaking 60 days later you would have the legal authority to sell those certificates of obligation. So you can see that would be set up for a July uh, 23rd City Council meeting and then the funds would be in the bank August 7th. So today is discussion. Do you want to move forward? Is this what the plan is? No formal actions today. The first formal action is May 14th uh, where you're giving notice to your citizen, allowing for feedback, and then on July 23rd, you would actually authorize an ordinance uh, authorizing the issuance of certificates of obligation if that's what the council wants to do. Great. Well, I want to commend you and thank you. Uh, we have a couple of, um, there, I would call them informal policies, informal um, uh, best practices, and one of those is bringing things early so people have a chance to hear about it, discuss it, ask their council people. So I, I appreciate you honoring that. That's very well, good. Well, that's, 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 just have it here. That's I mean, good. we just know right. uh, we don't want to force a discussion or a decision without the discussion. Absolutely. And that helps us a lot because the people can give us feedback and ask questions, and it's not just like this big surprise in front so of us. So to be clear, the projects that we've identified, they're supposed to cost in that one, one point two to $1.5 million range. Um, the fee we're collecting, I believe it's $5, is our drainage fee on every bill I pay it, you pay it, everybody who pays, utilities pays it. That would not go up as a result of this. Now we know that we have other drainage needs. We're gonna have a drainage meeting next Thursday with the public. Um, we have no plan for fixing, you know, we have no money or, or source of identified source of funds for fixing that other stuff. And we're gonna talk about that on Thursday night. We'll talk about what that would take, what it would cost, what our options are, whether there's grants, that kind of stuff. Um, but this is really to just make sure that all the improvements we did 20 years ago don't wash down the creek and that's what they're at jeopardy of doing right now um, and that's all that this would be for great all right any questions um, I have a couple but I'll, I'll open this up to council first no. No? Uh, our, our citizens have been clamoring from for drainage improvements for many years it's time to get off the mark for sure sure and this this really keeps us from going 
backward and it doesn't move us terribly far forward. So how does, right now, um, our, can you remind us of our, our city's credit rating? Uh, yes, the city's uh, AA minus, excellent rating. Uh, the fact that you'd have to go out and get a bond rating is something we wouldn't want to do. It's going to be right off the top, $15,000. This is in the size range so that when we sold those bonds, we sold them and sold them out to the public. It was a lar the last time we sold COs. It was a larger issue that we had interest from throughout the state, throughout the country really, to bid on the bonds. Here, it's a small issue. We don't want to pay $15,000. So we've talked with some of the local banks that would you consider buying it for your own account? And in that, they understand the risk, they understand the community, their taxpayers, they would just hold it and we don't have to spend $15,000 to get a bond rating. You can eliminate the cost. So you bring up the rating, which is important, and, and the city's finances today are better than they've ever been. So what you've done management-wise of financing is terrific, but we don't want to go that route just because it takes money that the bank is not going to give you a better or lower rate with us paying $15,000 to get that rating. Gotcha. Okay. So we maintain our current excellent credit rating. Yeah. Okay. So we would disclose to the market that we sold a private placement, if that's the direction we go. Um, so the market understands it. In their review, they'll take into consideration that we have a million three or a million four outstanding that we didn't have when we got the bond rating. But our finances are so strong that it's not going to make a, make a difference to them. Right. It won't jeopardize our current bond rating. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, no further questions? Thank you for the presentation. Okay. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And then, so do we want to go forward? Say, are we authorized to, to move forward with this? Is this a good idea? Are we... I'll make a motion that we authorize uh, appropriate funds to go forward. No, no motion. No. Well, my question is, it says, for certain drainage improvements and authorizing staff and consultants to proceed with the issuance. Okay. Is that, uh, we're not making a motion, but... No motion, just yeah, it says recommend no motion. Well, I'm all for it. Is there anybody... Can we... Well, wait. I mean, we're just authorizing staff to, to do what? To proceed with the issuance. So we'd come back with a notice of intent and... Uh, I guess it is to follow the timeline as outlined. outlined. Yeah, it's not even a motion. It's just, is there any issue with us going? Because normally the very first one, did you get a copy of this? Uh, no, I did not. Okay, it's just a timeline. And this is normally the next meeting would be the nor normally the one that we would make the decision, right. make the decision at. Right. Okay. And so it's really just saying, does council have any issue with us going forward with putting this on the agenda for, uh, for action? Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm okay with that. that that motion just saying proceed to bring this back for council yeah. yeah. does that need a staff to bring us um, a uh, proposal to the next for uh, scheduled meeting so for clarification do we need uh, a, can we make a motion on this or do we just need to see if there's any opposition to it right so so the, the way that it is set up the only motion that could be would, would be to have the staff do whatever they need to do in between here and there and bring it back to council that's the way we have to set up okay so, so, that, so, the, so the motion is appropriate. Yeah, we need to be more clear. No problem. We need to be more clear about these on the agenda items. So, I got the wording from. No, and, and, yeah, yeah, we just need. So we're just looking for direction, and I think, I think that's what you're saying. If you say yes, yes, we make a motion to keep moving forward to have council and staff bring it back for consideration. Okay. That's. I don't want to step on your toes or say no, no, incorrect. Right. That was the whole goal there, is just to get you all to say yes, come back and we'll take a formal action, yes or no, at your next meeting. You know, I think what we do is we, we move that to the, uh, the last item on here that is future agenda items and ask for it there. Is that appropriate or is it more appropriate to do it here? You can do it here. Okay. Okay. So with a motion and a second and a vote? All right. I have a motion. That's what I said. Great. I'll second. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. We'll see you here in May. See you Saturday. All right. Aye. Thank you, sir. All Thanks right. for coming out.
Yeah, thank you. Um, next item is we're moving up item number 11. That is presentation by city staff on the process for the sale of the gas utility system. Is Junior still here? Yeah, he's right there. Okay, sorry, you were hiding the offers. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that we were still going to address the thing that you talked about earlier. We're still going to talk about the ATVs and stuff like that. Yeah, that's actually in the report. Uh, yeah, I told him. He came into the store and asked me. Yeah, perfect. So I let him know. Cool. Thanks. There we go. So this will look very, very familiar. I will not do as good a job as uh, Simon Pena did. Uh, he really does know his stuff. Um, but just walking through, uh, and again, this is basically the same presentation we gave uh, on Thursday of last week. Uh, but just some background. So the City of Castroville Gas Distribution System, it was established in the 1960s. We learned from Sammy Shearhart, it was actually 1962. Um, with approximately 26.9 miles of coated steel mains and 694 services. The system currently consists of approximately 26.9 miles uh, or 78.2% of coated steel mains and 696 services and 7.5 miles, 21.7% of polyethylene or PE mains and 289 services. Uh, CPS Energy currently operates and maintains the system on behalf of the city, but has opted out of his current O&M operating agreement. That'll be effective October, well, round about October 1st of 2024. The system uh, is odorized and regulates pressure of the natural gas at the purchase point, which is a city gate outside the city limits, and regulates the pressure at a district regulator station within the city limits to feed the entire distribution, distribution system. Um, so here's just kind of a timeline. The city operated, started operating in 1962. Uh, I think we learned it was $250,000 to install the original system. Um, I, I did the a dollar inflated uh, number for 250, and it was like one and a half million today. Uh, that would be in today's dollars. But I guarantee you, to replace the system it would not be one and a half million. It'd be considerably more, I'm sure. Um, CPS Energy was hired in 2008 to operate and maintain the city's gas distribution system. Uh, the Texas Railroad Commission adopted first a 5% facilities replacement program rule, uh, 8.209. It went in effect in 2011, and then that was amended to 8% on January 6, 2020. Now, at the last meeting, we had a lot of conversation about, well, what is it? Is it 8% of the entire system? Is it 8% of some portion of the system? And what we learned from talking to Simon is it's 8% of some portion of the system based upon a, a, a system analysis which we have not conducted, the city has not conducted. What the uh, CPS Energy did at the end, or CPS Gas uh, did at the end of last year was not a, a exhaustive study. They basically threw something together to, to satisfy RRC. Um, so we would need to go through that, and I believe Simon estimated the cost of, of what that, that would be. But you'd have an engineering consultant come in and examine all your lines and it would probably be in the order of fifty to hundred thousand dollars to create that plan and then you would execute you'd submit that plan get it approved by RRC and then execute ex execute to that plan on an annual basis uh, fixing what needed to be fixed uh, it's very I know some of the questions we got last meeting was you know well, what would it cost what does that cost what does it cost to fix it what does it cost to bring it up to speed we don't know we don't know until we have a plan and then once you submit that plan um, it really it will be dependent. Well, how much it, of that of that system is deemed to be critical and in, ne in need of repair? And I, it's just a question I don't know the answer to. So we'll have to get that answer. And it, it, is it? And yeah, we really don't know, right? Uh, we do know what it costs to fix just 16 service lines at the end of last year, and that was about 75 grand. So um, you know, if you just use the same metric, then it could be in that ballpark. But that'll be something we have to figure out. In July of 2022, CPS informs Cashville of a proposed rate increase of 50%. I talked about it earlier. In September of 22, CPS and Cashville signed a one-year O&M agreement at an increase of approximately 13.5. So we were able to talk them down from 50% from to 13.5. And then after the initial year, two six-month extensions have also been agreed to. Um, 
And you know, CPS, CPS Energy Operations and Maintenance Agreement will now end in September of 2024, which is why we're, we're holding this election in part uh, to get that verdict. Uh, this is just a look at our revenues. We'll look at our revenues and our expenditures for the past five years. Uh, you can see our revenues are fluctuated between 675000 and well, actually between about just under 600000 in 2020. Uh, to a high of uh, just a little over 800,000, 810,000 in 2022. So that's, that's our revenues. Um, and a lot of that has to do with pass through cost of gas. If gas goes up, our revenues are going to go up. It's kind of like our airport that we manage now. When fuel prices fluctuate, you'll see that our revenues increase. But guess what? Our expenditures do too on the other side. And that's generally matches. You'll see these bar graphs will be very, very similar. So I'm going to back go back and forth to show how. It's, it's generally the same ones uh, that are going up and down, generally. All right, that's net. Um, so there's your expense, expenses for the past five years. Um, and it's about half that amount, amount. We do have a pretty generous markup, the city does, uh, on uh, our system, which is what allows for the uh, net income you're seeing now. And the net income has fluctuated between 105 at the low, that was in 2021, to uh, looks like about 265,000 in 2023. Um, again, I talked earlier about, you know, going forward, would we be able to see the same types of revenues um, with everything else being equal? And I, I think that's that's highly doubtful because the current cost of the contract that we're paying through paying CPS is lower than what we are now what the estimates that we have, the ballpark estimates we have for break fix and and all the other services that CPS provides. So when I take all those and add them together, and I'm not talking about adding people. This is just outside services, just so you understand. So if we had to add people, that would be an additional cost. But just relying on ad, uh, external sources, you're looking at um, a higher expense than what we're paying to CPS today. Um, and it's not a lot higher, but it's, it's if we're paying CPS, I think it's like 150. You're looking at close to 200 in, in those expenses. Now, if we were to take everything in-house, again, those costs, uh, it, it's just, these are ballpark estimates. Uh, we have a sewer system where uh, we have basically a, a supervisor and two crew. We know what we spend on the sewer system. It's in our budget. It's on the, on the website. And you can see that the cost of operations for the sewer plant is right around $750,000, $800,000 plus the cost of debt service, which is about a million. Now, granted, there's a lot of debt service at the sewer plant that you're not going to have in the gas system. But that operations side, you know, that's that could, you could be somewhere in that ballpark if the city had to do it all themselves. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that would be the case. But again, we're trying to give thresholds, right? Um, estimates. Um, until, again, uh, 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 all right, so anyway, connections. I'll go through this and, I'll, and then I'll uh, talk about a few other things. This, this is just your utility customers by year. Uh, you can see uh, from 2019 to 2023, um, it's relatively stable. That yellow line on the bottom is your gas uh, customers. And this is um, number, what is this, number of connections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a little bit confusing because of the spike there. That's not actually a spike. Yeah. That's it should be. commercial versus residential, commercial on the left, yeah. residential. Yeah, there we so go. So it's misleading because it's showing. Yeah, I was like, wait, what is it? Why Same years. It's 19 yeah. through 23 and 19 through 23. So you can see on the gas side, you know, when you look at the uh, commercial, we we, had, we went from 100 to 127 customers, basically. And we added roughly 30, 30 customers in 21, right? We've maintained those customers for the last three years. And then in 2019, um, it looks like we have 800 and we have a really, really solid 830 residential customers on the gas side. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the new Country Village area did build out their own gas system. We know that that is supported by our current system. That's 54 houses. They haven't all been built. Now, they aren't all guaranteed to have gas. In fact, of the ones that were built, I think only three of them ended up getting gas service. It was a small number. Um, so. Just because there's gas lines doesn't mean, just as you know, Mr. Holzell has pointed out, he's an all-electric customer. It's really up to each customer to decide whether they're going to have gas or not. Uh, so anyway, all of that's kind of guesswork on our part as to how much uh, future growth there would be. But 
we're basing this off of um, the number of houses they said they were going to build each year over the period of time that they said they're going to build houses. Now that information is as creditable, credible as the people providing it, which are the builders. And they are very, very, very conservative. So for instance, like Alsatian Oaks, if we go back and look at what their build schedule was, uh, we're going to exceed it by more than double this year. So they were, they were very conservative on the numbers they supplied. But if we use their numbers, which is really kind of the only numbers we can use, this just shows how many houses potentially could be added if every single one of them had gas. Now for Alsatian Oaks, keep in mind, they didn't put any gas into their first subdivision and they're not going to add it at this point. They could add it to their future units um, if we do a capacity analysis. If that capacity analysis shows that we can actually support uh, extending the line, et cetera. But all of those are unknowns at this stage. There's your gas pipe by top. We talked about this earlier, uh, but basically 80%, I said 70%, it's more like 80% is that steel coated, um, and 21% uh, is your uh, poly. Um, yeah. Is this before or after the CPS? This is current information. So, uh, this is after they did the 8% of repairs? Oh, uh, well, those are still, the service lines are what they replaced. The mains are still steel. So the mains are still steel, yeah. You're talking about. They were just the service lines. They it was 8%, yeah, it was 16. Yeah, there were 16 service lines. On Paris Street, yeah. yeah. So I think this is still accurate, yeah. All right. That's a good question. I'm pretty sure like that's still the same points. number. Um, so what are some of the challenges? And this is just to kind of talk about you know, what are the challenges of owning a gas system, basically? Uh, you got to maintain compliance with the DOT's Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration and the Texas Railroad Commission's Pipeline Safety Rules and Regulations. They, they're having a lot of changes, especially over the last about 10 years. Um, they've become more and more regulatory. Uh, every year, uh, new laws and regulations are passed and given the cities and gas systems to comply with. Up to 8%, and this is that up to 8% up to replacement per year mandated and associated cost for DEMP. Again, all cards on the table, understanding we still got to develop that plan. It's 8% of what? What does that cost? I don't know. I, we don't know. We'll have, that'll be something that we have to find out if we end up keeping the system. Hiring and training qualified and educated employees in this area. I know that's something that during, you know, when, when I had the opportunity to talk to uh, Bruce about his experience uh, work of the city, we spent about two and a half hours that day just hearing a lot. That would, you know, this is, it hasn't gotten any easier. This is one of the big challenges for small cities uh, is maintaining people, not just for, for the gas system, but water and sewer and, and keeping people trained. Um, and certainly gas system is, is no, um, it, it's basically the same way. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to keep and recruit people there. Um, and the immediate need for a qualified operator. So uh, we have to have a qualified operator. Now we can, uh, just like we did with CPS gas, outsource this, this function, but we would need to train up to it to, uh, I think it was Bruce's uh, point, that can be done uh, with our existing staff if we, can, you know, if, if we can convince our staff that this is a good idea and they're willing to do it, um, which is not a given. But that would be certainly something that we would try to do if we kept the system. Uh, uh, and then the cost of the system modeling, um, meeting existing and future demands. That goes back to that capacity analysis that we need to do. We actually do have a proposal in the works to get that done. Now, the, the person making that proposal for us needed to know the same information we needed to know about our own gas system for all these public meetings. So at, in real time, as we've been getting this information, putting together, creating a GIS database of it, because that didn't exist, doing all the things that, that um, would be uh, eventually needed were we to own the system, um, we were providing that to this other consultant. So we don't have a price of what that is, but here he estimates it between 50 and 100,000, and that's probably about right. Um, but I'll have an actual proposal probably by yes, next week. Question. Um, Let's let him go through the presentation, but maybe that's one of Workload, leak repair, system operations, maintenance activities, uh, you know, all of that's, those are all challenges. Uh, new capital projects may result in higher rates. I, I, I think that's pretty realistic, uh, depending on, again, the cost of that capital. The city basically has been since CPS took over, uh, there have no, been no capital projects of the gas on the gas system of any consequence. 
Um, this past December was the first time we spent any real money on our gas system ourselves. Um, so this would be a new thing, and more than likely, it would either cut into our revenues, or it potentially we'd have to raise rates to pay for those capital projects. Uh, but again, what that is and what the amounts are, we just don't know at this time. Uh, line replacement costs, that's kind of what we already talked about. That. Potential for added burden uh, on utility fund, I just kind of mentioned that. Um, our current gas loss and unaccounted for rate is 13%. The, nat the state average is five. Anything over 10 is a concern for our RRC. Um, now, a good portion of that is meters. We, we know for a fact there were meters that for seven years hadn't read, you know, basically people are getting free gas. They, the, 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 the meter had not been replaced. Um, anyway, it, so we know those types of things existed. We have just gone through replacing a ton of our meters. There is still a handful that haven't been replaced yet, and we pushed pause on all of that until we figure out, are we selling the system or keeping the system? If we keep it, we'll need to do that, right? Um, but that could it, uh, impact the um, amount of gas that we're, that we're tracking. It's very possible that you know, there, some of that's just meters in our metering. Um, and what portion that is, I, I don't know at this stage, but it's certainly something that we'll find out as quickly as we can. Uh, advantages of not selling, you know, obviously some of them were mentioned tonight, Continu continued future revenue, whatever that revenue is. Um, the city controls the rates, so we have no one to blame but ourselves when it comes to the rate, um, which I think is kind of a good thing. And then uh, potential growth of the system. As the system grows, you, just like we're experiencing with water and sewer, as those new houses come in, to the extent that they use our water and sewer and our NRCCN, they help pay for our capital infrastructure. The same thing happens with our gas system. To the extent that we're able to extend the gas system, to the extent we have the capacity to do that, um, those are future rate payers that could help pay for the replacement of our aging and aged uh, gas system. Um, so advantages of sale, uh, economies of scale, bargaining power, reduce regulatory burden, one-time revenue from the sale. I think there's been some questions about well, where does that revenue go? It comes to the city, the city council. Can you back up and describe each one of these? Uh, I, I didn't want to, these aren't my bullet points, I didn't want to elaborate too much. The economy of scale really has to do with the fact that if you sell to a larger system, we have two large ones that are operating right on our doorstep. Centerpoint does the gas for Honda. I don't know how long they've been doing it, but they, they own the, the Honda system. They own the Honda system. They Honda own the Honda system. The system. They own the Honda system. Okay. Honda doesn't do anything with gas. Um, and then you have West Texas Gas, which has bought some of the smaller systems out here. And you heard Simon mention that his was bought by West Texas Gas. So um, you've got two very large operators. And it may not be one of them that buys us. It could be someone else if, again, the election were, were to result in the approval of a sale. Um, but they obviously have the economies to scale that we don't. They have operators. They have people they're recruiting. You know, they, they, they just got more resources than we do. That's what that means. Um, the bargaining power. I, um, he said during the presentation, yeah. a larger establishment compared to the city would have more, better bargaining power because they have the resources. Well, yeah, I guess everything they, they do the when it comes to yeah, yeah. Right. when it comes to replacing pipe or whatever, their costs are going to be lower than our costs. Yes. I guess that's what that means. Yes, and then reduce. I don't, I don't, that's what he said yeah. during the thing. And I don't think there's just being having been in the the uh, wholesale distribution. Most of that's commodity items. So I don't think that it's massive. I don't right. think it's massive one way or the other. There are some economies of scale. Some, some of them yeah. maybe too different. But uh, then the uh, no, release, economies of scale there are the, the increased bargaining yeah. power for most of their material is going to be minimal. But the economies right. of scale, when you look at how many people it takes to operate it, spreading that across sure. a larger system, absolutely. And, and the redundancy that they already have of personnel and right. materials. Yeah. Then uh, the reduced regulatory burden, obviously, that we get out from under all of that. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do any of that. Um, the one-time revenue, I don't know what that revenue is. I don't know how big it is. Is it $200,000? Is it $2 million? I really don't know. Um, future revenue from franchise fees, um, that could be an advantage um, because you can get between 3 and 5%. Now, if you just looked at our, uh, going back to our uh, revenues, um, it'd be 5% of these numbers, right? So, you're talking about 35 to 40 grand. I mean, that's not a lot. I'm just going to be very candid. But it is revenue that you don't have to do anything for. 
right? It's very much like the franchise fee that we assess on the CPS electric that is in our city, of Texas, right? Uh, where we don't have electric CCN, but they're operating. We charge them a franchise fee. We get that money and we really don't have to do much for it to, to get that. And the same would be true for this, uh, this, this gas revenue. But it would be a far cry from the 250 that we make now. <coughs> that we are not guaranteed to make in the future. Yeah, that we're not guaranteed, yes. And, but, but again, that would be set by us. You know, if you want to charge your people, be double the rates you're doing now. And I mean, it just, yeah. Um, okay, I think that was that, yeah. Uh, this is just a legal authority to sell the municipal gas system, where it comes from. It's in the state code. Um, and obviously, we've already called the election. Uh, the next steps is uh, go out and vote. Um, we'll see the results of the vote on May 4th. May 5th, we'll know what, what, which direction we're going to head as a city to a certain extent. Because again, the next step is if the, the vote is the results in yes, we want to allow the city council to sell the system, it doesn't mean we're selling the system. What it means is that we'll go out and get proposals, we'll look at what the offers are, and council will make the decision whether you want to accept one of those offers or not. And in that negotiation, we will negotiate all kinds of things, like the future rate, how long that rate's good for, the franchise fee. There's a lot of questions that will be answered that can only be answered through that negotiation process. Um, so that's kind of what happens next. Uh, and obviously the state's the last bullet. You know, if you, you could choose, even after all that process, even if the citizens say, yes, we, we'd like to allow the city council to sell it, you still don't have to sell it. If you get, uh, there have been three cities that Simon was telling me that um, elected to sell their systems, went out and got offers, and then in each of the three cases, for one reason or another, the uh, people offering to buy the system backed out. So those cities are stuck with a system they don't want for a price they can't even sell it for, like they can't even basically give it away. Um, and I'm not saying that's our situation here, but there are three you know scenarios like that happening right now in the state of Texas uh, that Simon uh, is, you know, cities that he's working with. Uh, so anyway, so no, no guarantees in life as we all know. Uh, I think that's it. I heard there are a couple of questions. What I'd like to do is uh, give our city attorney a, a taboo buzzin button. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, <laughs> uh, so I think that the best way to do this, the reason that I'm saying anything about this is because we have to be very careful about what we're saying and how we say it, um, just in providing facts, but I know that we have a lot of questions. Would it be appropriate if uh, each one of us asked you the question to verify that it is an okay question to ask for staff? That's how we handled it at the town hall. Okay, so, so um, I'll start with, uh, with uh, Councilman Dyer. If you'll ask your question to the city attorney to make sure that it's an appropriate uh, question to ask, and then if so, then the uh, city administrator will answer. I have three questions. What date did we switch to West Texas gas? The date. I don't know, but we. Is that sorry. a valid question? Yeah, that's a strictly factual. The fact. Yeah. I don't you know. You can't until she tells you yes. We've been buying. Uh, <laughs> we've been buying from West Texas gas for a very long time. Very long. Time. We need to know a date. I think there was some concern that people thought that CPS was providing us the gas, and they're just our operator. So. Can we find that date? Yeah. Seems like that's an important date. Uh, why is it important? Can I ask that question? Why does it matter? Well, I think, we buy it, our gas I think it helps us establish credibility for West Texas gas. I mean, if, if uh, we've only had them a month. No, no, no. We've been buying from, like, as long as we've been with CPS, for sure. Okay. But I think we were buying from them. So it like, could be. It could since be 30 years. Since 1962. I don't know. A long time. I don't know. Because they were a sub to CPS. Yeah. One of their suppliers. Okay. Second well, question. no, no, they, they supply, so it's two, two separate things. CPS was providing the services. If you think about, they're, they're the mechanic that's working in your car. We're buying the gas from the gas station, which is okay. the, West, Texas, West yeah. Texas gas, yes. Second question, is West Texas gas considered to be our qualified operator? I mean, in your chart, you said, yeah. yeah. It had to have a qualified Again, operator. No, West Texas Gas is the gas station that we're going to. The operator is CPS Energy or CPS Gas. Okay. CPS Gas. Okay. They're our operator. Right. Okay. That, they're the reason we have to go. Third question. 
it, it, from listening to the briefing, it is evident that no matter which way the election goes, it doesn't make any difference, the city is going to have to determine the book value of the system. You're going to have to do that no matter what. What do we have any idea what it will cost, how long it will take, who would do it generally? I'm mean, just wondering how will we go about doing that? Is that a fair question? I, you want to I mean, I can answer it. The answer I just won't be able to give a definite answer. Right. You, you can answer. Yeah, it, yeah. As it's, long as we don't think it's, it's it's a supposition on my part, so I'm going to be clear. Uh, I don't know who would do that, but I think Simon offers that service, so that he oh, you would probably contract. You probably out. would use him, but I, there are several people that could help us figure that out. Um, we already know the. I the, don't know what that value company. is, and I'm not going to try and guess at it. Okay. Um, I will say that in talking with Simon. Although that is the methodology for buying a system, it's what the RRC requires, there are, uh, th there are examples of purchases where the purchase price exceeded the known book value. Mm -hmm. yeah, but and that's what we would seek to do here. We would seek the best know. possible outcome, which means getting the highest price and we would let the buyer deal with the RRC as far as justifying that price. And that's how that would play out. Okay. Any further questions? No. Thank all you. Right. I was going to say, all, I was going to say, watch and learn how Councilman Dyer did it. That's how we should proceed. Nicely done. Good job. Councilman Merz. I did it. All right, we're, real quick, we're going to revisit one of the questions. Our contract started with West Texas Gas. It was December 1st, 2009. What? December oh, 1st, 2009. Do you know who you bought from before? I don't remember. Bruce might remember. Bruce, do you remember? I can tell you that the pipeline, the high pressure line, it used to be Valero. Valero. And then it was Enterprise Gas. That's right. And then it was West Texas. Yeah. That same pipeline, different utilities, still different systems, bought it as a firm. Gotcha. Thank you. So what's West Texas since 2009? And it's ongoing. Great. Thank you. Okay, Council Members. With respect to analyzing the system and making a plan and doing the line replacement, would a potential buyer be under the same requirements as us? Yes. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was easy. <laughs> right, right. Because if you can answer yes or no, then that's a strictly, strictly factual question. Or, and if you can answer with a specific piece of information, then that's a stri strictly factual response. Mm. Scott, you need to pay attention to Councilman <laughs> Dyer. <laughs> I'm going to elaborate on a question you didn't ask, which is, if they bought our system and they had larger systems, would, our, would they have to replace 8% of our system or whatever they deemed every year? And I believe, I believe the answer to that is no. Because once they once they acquire the system, we become part of their whole system. And whatever needs to be replaced here becomes part of the whole that needs to be replaced. So it may or may, that would be, a I'm, I'm bringing this up for council's awareness, that that is another negotiating point with the buyer, is what, something you'd want to ensure is that they are investing in our system, that they're making improvements. And so you'd want to have that contractually obligated as part of the sale. Thank you. Okay. No more questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Councilman King? No question. Councilman Kerr? Uh, I think I already know the answer to this. I have been asked uh, by a couple of people how I'm voting, and I refuse to answer that question, and I think that's probably the appropriate answer. Especially from the dais, whatever you choose to do outside of the council chambers, councilman, is <laughs> you may do so. Thank you. Okay. Put the pressure back on you. Yeah. <laughs> Councilwoman Martinez. Um, during Mr. Pena's presentation, he made a statement that uh, CPS uh, submitted an evaluation of Castroville's system to the Railroad Commission. Has city staff seen that report? I have not seen that report. Okay. But I believe John... Uh, <coughs> 
He's hiding. Uh, have you not? Yeah. I think John saw it, but again, no one on, just being clear, no one on the city staff really has any experience with the gas system. Mm -hmm. So even if we saw it, I don't know what we know what we're looking at. But I, yeah, we haven't trained it, right? Right, because be, I'm looking at it, that information would be very, very important to determine future things. Well, y'all may or may not recall, but in part of the negotiation with, and I know Cindy may recall, in the negotiation with CPS Gas, when, when they were, it was time to renew their contract. And we looked at the contract, and one of the issues was who has proprietary ownership of all of the information they've done on, on part of the city. And so that's something that I talked at length with them about in the in the verbiage of the contract because in my reading it looked like they owned everything and they weren't going to give anything to us. Now I will go back and repeat what I said before. CPS has been very helpful through this whole process. I don't anticipate they're going to do a 180 at the last second, but um, there's some information we still don't have from them that we're we're, we're getting from them. So um, that was going to be my next question: is has have we asked CPS to send us? all documentation that they have on our system that they've done all this time. That way we have the historic records on our end. I, I don't know the answer. No, I mean, can I answer can, that? Can he answer that or? Well, but, well I'm going to answer that for him. Okay. Because that, that's going a little bit far from Okay. Yeah. Um, what we can ask for is whatever was contractually obligated in that contract to CPS. Okay. Okay, that way our records, I'm just looking to keep us with the history. And we have done that. We've asked for everything they're contractually obligated okay. to give us. Um, and then uh, at, the, at the meeting also, uh, West Texas Gas was said they are very interested in doing our O&M. When, when staff comes and after the election brings us, you know, the different options, is it, are we going to have options of... Um, like the military does we don't always have the experienced person but we will contract it out just to do the operating and maintenance are they going to be one of the companies that we reach out to so this is not how that works okay this is not how that works okay so if the voters determine that they will give that authority to the council to proceed with the next steps in in this gas election the next steps is um, you get with your consultant you prepare that bid paperwork. You don't, and you put it out there. Okay. And then bidders from Texas, bidders from you know, across the United States. In some instances, I've seen bidders from outside of the United States put in a bid, you know, for that whatever that uh, request for qualifications or request for proposals uh, contains. So. And then from there, they are evaluated, and your consultant will give you an evaluation of each of those bids. Just the same way that you would, you know, take a bid from a from a, for engineering services or, right. or you know how your engineers put out your bids for a construction yes. contract or whatever. The the cons your gas consultant will do the same thing for you. Of both the selling it or just to do the contract to do the maintenance of it. Right. right. Okay. They will they will they will walk you through each of those steps. Okay. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, I have a few. Then uh, you've actually. Some of the things that I had a question, uh, had questions about were already covered in this, so thank you. I apologize I couldn't be here on Thursday. I made the same decision that Mr. Alexander did and I went and I met my grandson. It's very nice. Uh, so you had covered the financial risk. So you had covered the financial risk if we do sell the system. You covered the financial risk if we do not sell the system. Uh, because I think that we have some on both sides, so thank you for that. Um, we covered the valuation of the system, so thank you for that. Um, so one of the things that, just from feedback from some of the folks that I've talked about, uh, there was a question about, uh, this feels very rushed. It feels like we, can we answer that? We cannot answer the timeline? Then I will not answer. Okay. Um, can we talk about the attempts to find contractors uh, based on what we heard. Cannot talk about that. Perfect. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you covered all the it's things I could talk about. Yes. Yeah. Um, can I ask... Anything uh, that, that, that takes a response of more than one or two sentences, mm -hmm. that, that's the clue. We cannot talk about it. It has to be perfect. strictly factual. That's yeah. perfect. I, 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 if I may, there's, a lot, there's just a lot of unknowns that we cannot 
definitively answer at this right. stage, which you can't. We're not going to be able to until we go through this process, until we find out. And I know it's frustrating. I know people you know, can make their suppositions, where, you know, mm -hmm. accusations they want, but it is what it is. We're dealing with what we can. We're doing the very best we can. Great. Uh, can, uh, can I ask about the timing? So from 2008, CPS Energy took over the system. Can I ask uh, somebody that might have experience with that why that decision was made? I can. Perfect. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Because there's stuff you can ask about not on the dais. Keep right. in mind, Perfect. if you want to okay. have a conversation separately, you can do that all day long. Okay. You can't have it up here as we're talking about an election. No, I appreciate you keeping okay. us in line with this. I mean, it's it's a hard thing because it's it's uh, there's it lots of questions. Very fine line to walk. Right. That's why I'm asking you first. Can we talk about the other? Uh, cities in Medina County who have gone through this process. Okay. And my last one was, um, I don't think I could talk about that either. <laughs> and, and I will reiterate, yeah. the, this doesn't mean that these are questions that you cannot discuss with the constituency, you know, with any persons that are interested. It just means that while we're here at the diets, we cannot expand city resources, you know, Perfect. any type of discussion that looks like we're trying to sway the vote one way or the other. Okay, perfect. Well, let me ask, uh, I think the answer is no. Um, can I ask about what are the possible uses uh, if we sell the system, what bucket it goes into, whether into the general fund or the utility fund, or is that a decision that we make? Um, that is a decision that the council makes um, at the appropriate time. Perfect. The factual answer is it comes to the, the city council. The, the sale of the system, once it's sold, mm -hmm. goes into the general fund, and then the council decides what to do with that money. But it could go back into the utility the fund. The council decides yeah. what to do with that money. Perfect. Okay. That's all of the questions that I cannot ask. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would encourage everybody to reach out uh, separately if you have questions about that, and I'll do the same. Uh, uh, one more just tidbit. I, I'm very grateful for the comments that happened Thursday night. Believe it or not, I mean, there's some things that we just did, we didn't think about doing. I talked to Deborah afterwards. We did not think to run an ad in the paper. Some of us we wouldn't have had very much to run because we, we really got down to. I got the presentation the day before, like the night before uh, we presented it. Um, but we did run an ad. Um, we basically, for council's information, we put an ad together. Uh, it's very similar to what Lytle ran, uh, but with more legal maybe oversight than they than they received. Um, so that's in the paper. It'll be in the paper this Thursday. It'll be in the paper f next Thursday uh, for Council's uh, awareness. We also um, put this presentation a uh, modified Q&A. You know, the, the Q&A that was distributed to you was basically from two people. It had their names on it. They'd asked some questions. Some of the questions they answered really we couldn't answer. So I tried to make them more generic on purpose. <coughs> So uh, those people may look and say, this isn't the question I asked. Well, it's not your question anymore. I created, I took those questions as kind of a general guide and created some very generic questions about our Q&A. That's on the website. All of that will be on a QR code that will be on the ad. But if you go to our website today, it's right at the very top of the menu. You can, it says gas election. You can go to that page and hopefully get some good information. We also issued an iInfo with a link to that same website uh, yesterday. So we're trying to get the word out. We know it's very, very late, um, but we're doing our best to inform people. Absolutely. Just to let you know, I, I did receive uh, the first, we had 13 voters yesterday. It's on the website with the names. So uh, hopefully, as uh, far as I know, they will send me a day after. The, it doesn't say how they vote. It just says a list of voters. And the day after, uh, I believe they're going to send me a page each. And I'll put it up just to kind of keep a count. Okay, great. So we'll know if you don't vote. That's right. Yes. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, That's right. Vote your heart, vote your mind. And right. We will five, deal with five, whatever uh, comes out of There is five different locations that if you cannot make it out here to mm -hmm. our main one, uh, it is listed on our website. Uh, but there is five different, uh, because the county does participate in this all program for mm -hmm. the election. So you can go if for some reason you're, I don't know, uh, at Hondo itself, you can go in there and ask for this ballot and you can vote in the, the city election. Anywhere in the county you can vote. 
So if you find yourself in some place in the county, you can ask. You just have to get our ballot. Right? Yes. And I will. All right. Please get out and vote. Mm -hmm. All right. It will not be at City Hall, though. Yeah. There's no voting here. I know right. we've done county it in the past. It's not here. Okay, right. next item. Uh, consider and take appropriate action on awarding a contract with Keeley Construction for the Country Village lift station upgrades in an amount not to exceed eight hundred sixty-two thousand two hundred fifteen dollars and ten cents. Um, so I'll just this is one of the items that's on the CIP. We're very very pleased with the the amount that we got. I think our original engineer's estimate was uh, a little bit high, a little bit north of the number that that we're looking at right now, and. Uh, this number uh, was that the other bid was several hundred thousand dollars higher. So, um, you know, we're, we've had the, the contractor vetted. We've made sure they actually did, you know, bid on each item. They didn't neglect to, to include anything. So we're, we're ecstatic to get a number that's uh, reasonable <laughs> in this day and age when uh, prices are going nuts. Um, and uh, the, this, again, it's a CIP funded item. Um, this is one of several uh, lift station upgrades that need to be done, but this is the one that's of the highest priority, which is why it's being done first. And thank I don't you know for what else you want. I, I appreciate the fact that you're taking this forward. Um, this is something that in talking to some of the neighbors um, over the past few years, they were very concerned with a new subdivision that was going next door. They're like, well, we can't even we can't even handle what we're having have, uh, what we're doing now. And what we keep hearing from the city is that no, it doesn't need any upgrades. But then when we talk to the guys that are actually working on it, they're saying we need upgrades. Yeah, definitely. So upgrades. it's good. You've got a good feedback loop with the, the feet on the street. You're paying attention to that. You're listening to the people. So thank you for continuing to move this forward. Well, thank you for funding it. I mean, this wouldn't happen if y'all hadn't funded it. I do want to point out uh, Joel is here with uh, K-Freeze. For any technical or engineering questions or project scope or any of that stuff, uh, he, I'll direct those questions to him. Perfect. Thank you. Councilman Merz, do you have any questions since this is? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that we've talked about this enough. I know that we, we feel like it's needed. Uh, the one question, does this, uh, this does not add capacity to the system. It adds reliability, correct? I'm sorry, can you repeat your question? What you're uh, for the lift station, it does not add capacity for more flow. It adds re uh, reliability to a capacity that is not exceeded. Correct, correct. So there is adequate capacity in the wet well and the pumps. We're just making the system more reliable. Also, the system um, experiences ragging, basically when people throw rags down the down the sewer system. Uh, right now, what's happening, it's clogging the existing uh, pumps. So we're actually putting in better pumps that would that would grind the, the larger um, so solids, and then it'll pump that out. So, I got one question. OK. Will K-Freeze be responsible to oversee this and be the inspector for I, the contractor? I don't think we are tasked to or do who the is inspection. Doing it? The inspection, I believe, is the staff we do. So, yeah, we, we hired an in-house inspector. Uh, we, I don't know if you all are aware, but uh, we had an inspector that we had hired. He's left or separated from the city. And we now have Rodney, a guy by the name of Rodney, that is our city inspector. He'll inspect it. He comes from, was he in Sarah? Uh, Sarah? Yeah, he, he's another Sarah. We keep robbing Sarah employees. Well, I guess, <laughs> I guess my Sarah question is bigger than that. If, if we go back to Ram 2, when the sewer line was put in, we didn't have enough money in the contract to pay for an on-site inspector. Correct. And we're still paying for it to this day. My question is, are we going to have an on-site inspector while this contract is being executed? And if so, who is it? And what are we paying them? So we have an in-house inspector, and yes, he'll be on-site maintaining this. Now, I mean, I, I understand your concern. Um, it's very unfortunate that the city had that experience. I, it, I, and you're comfortable that I'm that's comfortable adequate. with our That's what I'm really wondering. We, is, I, I, are I'm, you adequately comfortable with that. Right. I'm certain that there will be conversations between Rodney and k to ensure that what's being inspected and, and the major milestones. So if we don't have that, and that's something that we definitely need to develop Correct. before the project kicks off is what are the milestones that are being inspected and what are we really looking for? Correct. Um, but yeah. I mean, is, 
I would say on the order of complexity, this isn't this isn't a RAM two project in, in terms of complexity. Um, you know, the, the, it's replacement of pumps. Um, yeah, you know, there's no. I'm trying to think. Of, there's some electrical upgrades. There's Correct. Uh, there's SCADAs. Uh, doing a generator on site, new yard piping, a new fence, uh, new site security, um, some new just uh, site civil stuff on the, on the bottom. Um, so one of the benefits of this is that you know we've been involved with JJ and he's been kind of guiding us on in, in the design process. So we do have the operator standpoint, the engineering, and now with the inspection. So we are working together. Well. For the pumps and the generators, um, are they going to be enclosed in a building? No. Because I'm, I'm just thinking just in case we go through Snowmageddon again, mm -hmm. are we going to have them insulated somehow? or? So the pumps are within the wet well. They're submersible, so okay. they'll be in the actual system. All right. And then the generator is being added to add the reliability. But the generator is not in a building. Right. No, the generator is not in a building, but it is no, outside. But it is enclosed. It's, it's enclosed. Okay. It, it's, it's enclosed within its own that's, system. That, it has its own fuel tank, and that, that's what I'm checking on. It's a natural okay. gas. Oh, yes, natural gas. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, just in case. Right. <laughs> is the generator automatic self-starting, or does it require manual? No, correct. It is. It is an auto start. I'm sorry. It auto is an start. auto start. Auto start. It would kick on when the power system. So it um, automatically comes on. Correct. Okay. Thanks, sir. I just wanted to point out that the, uh, the total number here that we are looking at also includes a $72,000 contingency fee, which we hope we don't have to spend on this. So Correct. Any type of older system, we would always try to include a limited contingency. Historically, we haven't been using a lot of it, but it's just there just to preserve. and. Hopefully, we don't this time. So there you go. The settings on the, the um, ATS, on the transfer system, um, are those temperature-based as well? No. Okay. So if the temperature, because I know that one of the issues that we had with the River Bluff lift station was that basically, from what I understand, the gas line froze up before it could reach it, and that's why it didn't start up. Um, I'm not familiar with that system, but yeah, we can definitely typically investigate that. What we do, like I deal with backup power a lot, so what we do is we have like temperature-based, once it reaches the freezing point, um, that you can start up natural gas systems. Uh, but that is not an option on this either? Right now, no. We can definitely include that if, if it's, it's an option. So we can okay. definitely include Well, we it either do it as an option, like an automated option or as a policy option. Mm -hmm. Once we reach a certain temperature for a certain duration, we auto cycle it and just make sure that it, it maintains that heat. Okay. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? No. All right. So. Um, I got a question. Yes, please. How do you auto cycle a lift station? With float. Oh, well, we on this system, well, the actual pump system, or are you talking about the. Well, no, you're talking about the generator. Saying. Basically, you take it off of oh, city power. It's the generator. And you put it under the, the generator. Power. Okay. Yes, sir. I had a stupid question. I, 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 I wasn't paying attention. But by the way, a, a clarification I believe on the RAM project that the city did hire, not K Freeze, it was a private, it was a previous engineer. It was KSA, KSA, but then they cut it out. They cut out the KSA. Through, so through the project, project, they quit toward the end of the project, we, we, ran, we ran out of the budget number. But the first yes. parts of that, the majority of it, they did have a, right. uh, mm. the civil engineer was watching the project. In, in my line of work, we call that devalue engineering. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, uh, the cost <laughs> of that is significant. Yeah, this, it's out of scope. We can talk about that separately, yeah. but yeah. there's, there's okay. a lot to that unpack there. You know, I had another question about the, um, you said a new fence around the, uh, the lift station. Um, I just want to make sure that it's something that is respectful to the neighbors around there so that we're not putting Probably it. Probably not going to be. Okay. I think it's going to be, it's going to be, well, I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying that because, go ahead. Well, so yeah, the new fence will be wooden. Right now it's, it's wooden, but it's older. So we'll have a eight foot privacy fence around the Oh, that's station. a better answer than I was going to give. I just know that what we have, we are. I didn't want a prison have, style, like razor wire. I don't know why not. Um, <laughs> our, I, I was just going to be clear though. What we put there is dictated by. We, we'll put the best thing we can that TCQ allows, and right. that's the that's the caveat. So you know what we'd want to put there and what we have to put there are two different things. My point with it is that if it is going to be something that is visually detracting then we just need to let people know and it's mm -hmm. better to have them see that ahead of time than to be surprised with it when something goes up. It'll be better than what's there now. Correct. Yeah. So the two options would be six foot with a barbed wire fence to have that eight foot of security clearance 
or an eight foot wooden fence or an eight foot chain link fence. We opted just replacing kind with an eight foot wooden fence. Right now it's a six foot, but we're adding just to meet the TCQ compliance. Great, thank you. So privacy. Cool. I was gonna say that the current fence is pretty degraded. My daughter has tried to crawl through holes in it several times and she would have fit. Um, and the, the neighbor who's adjacent to it already has a chain link fence, so I don't think they're gonna get too worked up over chain link if we end up having to go with that for some reason. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So right now it's an eight foot wooden, so we right. good. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So do I have a motion to approve as read? I move we approve the contract to Keeley Construction in the amount not to exceed $862,215.10 for the planned capital improvement project of Country Village List Station. Do I have a second? I'll second. Great. I have a uh, motion by Councilman Dyer, second by Councilman Mers. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Uh, next item is staff reports. Scott, you I, want to start I, with the, the PD? Yeah, I see the chief kitten up and down. Um, uh, so I think we'll invite the chief to the podium. We're um, he he provided a couple of updates uh, about the carts and uh, you know the, the golf carts and then uh, the stop signs. So you can take those in any order you like, unless the mayor dictates otherwise, chief. Please. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> he said, I'm not allowed to ask any more questions to our attorney. She tells me no. Thank you. That is a sample city ordinance from the uh, city of Kyle. Um, that I may look up for the So, whatever order you want to take it from there. Uh, let's talk about what our current regulations. There have been some questions, and it's it's not just from one individual, but from several, uh, asking about, based on what we've seen in city, uh, it has been, I mean, this is very, very thorough. So I applaud you for going, like, completely the extra mile with this. But well, thank you to Cindy. She, she supplied half of that. Yeah. Well, you did. Thank you. <laughs> well, nice. Even though you tell me no, that's, I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, so with the, the things, I think what we see right now is primarily um, like ATVs, not ATVs, the UTVs and golf carts. That's primarily, I, I don't think I've seen, and I've seen wheelchairs. Lawnmower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lawnmowers, tractors. Yes, sir. But I think that the biggest offenders that I've seen have been golf carts and the UTVs. Correct. Actually, I looked also at the... Um, the city of Lakeway also, um, in their ordinances, and I didn't print out their ordinances, I didn't find this one until later, but they address the recreational off-highway vehicles, they call them uh, ROVs, and you got the neighborhood electric vehicles, the NEVs, and utility vehicles. The city of Lakeway addresses all of them. And keeping in mind what you can look at is what I found unique about Lakeway is they actually went out and, and did certain roads that they were not allowed on and it didn't have to do with the speed limit. And they also had no nighttime, period, um, which I thought but was with our current regulations, what, what is allowed? Uh, current what? regulations is what they have to have on those is the, um, I think it's in the handout, was, um, first of all, no underage drivers, correct? Correct. You are operating on a, on a roadway. You have to have a driver's license and everything else. Okay. Just, just like you have a, a motor vehicle. Mm -hmm. I think what happens is, and I was thinking about that while I was sitting here, I was like, you know, we're not going to go sit in somebody's front, <laughs> front, front driveway looking for a violation. And that's the difficulty is we're not everywhere. You know, so if we see one, yes, we can address the issue. But, you know, they usually go short distances. I've never seen one. I've talked to officers. They haven't seen them at the Walmart. Maybe they've gone there. I don't know. We haven't seen them. Um, but a lot of the stuff, in fact, when I pulled up here in park, there was one of the uh, UTVs going down the road. And I'm like, hmm. He had his, his uh, slow-moving vehicle on and everything else. But the beauty of this is you all can make the regulations, if you so desire, how you want those to happen. Well, I think that we look first at what are, what are our regulations and right. what are we enforcing. Are there any that we're not enforcing? So it's really looking first at 
what are the the regulations? And what I've seen is, is it, how do you separate that out? Vehicles that are able, to, so there was one that was, if you're operating under 35 miles an hour, there was one, if there's a vehicle that's uh, able to go over 25 miles an hour, I think it was? Yes. Okay, so what, can you, can you? That was, that was a unique thing, and I haven't even heard of the, the what do they call them, the uh, NEVs? I uh, started looking at them, they're, they're. In our current regulations, that's in there? No, 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 okay. it's not in there. So we have no ordinances current, at all. I'll ask it again. The current regulations, what are our current regulations? What is allowed and what is not allowed? Under 25 miles an hour speed limit, they can drive them on the roadway if they have a driver's license and everything else. Okay. Do, they everything can else cross is, Highway 90, but they, they have to have drive. lights? Do they have to have? Yes. Everything that's listed in this ordinance that I, that I picked up, the lights, the slow-moving vehicle placard, um, and everything else that they have to have. Some of them, they don't have to be registered with a license plate. I saw the city of Kyle does a permit, probably just like Port Aransas does. They do permits uh, with theirs, which is a total different animal. And that, I was in Port Aransas about two months ago, and it is crazy down there. Uh, but here, I think it's, it's a little bit more of, of catch. You know, it's difficult to, once we get the complaints, I know that uh, Arnie back here complained about a motorcycle and two kids riding on it, and it took us a while before we finally caught that person. Mm -hmm. uh, was a violation, violation there. So it's just really us catching those people that are violating, but they right. should have everything that you have like a regular motor vehicle. But I think we need to have, if you, we need to have that ordinance in place, and I think not restrict it, but actually make certain things that they have to do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not, um, I wouldn't say not driving at night. That's totally, that's y'all's decision. That's not my decision. So in our current regulations, I, I want to keep this first. We can we can talk about possibilities right. going forward, but in our current regulations really is what I'm trying to understand. The current regulations is a roadway has to be under 25 miles an hour, or 35, 35. miles an hour. The roadway has, so. Yes. Is that, driver's our, license. is that state law or is that state local law. ordinance? There is, there is no yeah. city. So there is no city we ordinance. We don't have an ordinance for this. Yeah, you do not. So right. state law. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's well, what I'm clarifying. Yeah. Yeah. I want, we do I not. want to understand okay. first what, is, what are the state regulations because okay. I'll be honest with you, I don't understand what they are. But, and so okay. we can get into the other one. This briefing is long, covers all of the state law. It would take us an hour to discuss it. It seems to me we, we, we know we don't have a clear city ordinance, so this is the law of Texas. The question that I think we should be addressing is, do we want to ask the staff to go and write a local ordinance that's more restrictive? Can we do that? Uh, yes, and I was getting yeah. to that. And then we just, because the, the I just like to yeah, not, I, not spend two hours talking about this nope. tonight. This shouldn't take two hours to understand okay. what the regulations are and what what are so what I've seen is I've seen golf carts and, and I'm asking this for my own clarification I have a UTV that has all of the required things it has insurance it is not registered and so and I have stopped driving it except on my own property because like I'm I mean I've taken it over to my parents house but I want to make sure that I've got everything in line that I'm supposed to have in line and so I think there's other people most of the people that I've seen that I know the people that are driving them around, the one violation that I've seen that, that scares me that I think is completely inappropriate is kids driving them. Correct. So I think that if we are very clear about the fact that if a an, so an unlicensed driver is driving on a city street, then they will be pulled over if they are caught. Correct. Right? So yes, we have to we have to make sure that our officers are enforcing that. So what I don't understand is which ones need the slow moving vehicle signs and which ones need an actual registration with a license plate? I don't think any of them need that license plate. Let me verify that real quick. I know the golf carts do not. They do, you can, mm -hmm. but they do, it's not required. It's not required. But it needs to have, does it need to have the slow moving? Yes. Okay, all of them, yes. regardless of it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. it says here regarding license plate, with the exception of operation in certain master plan communities, a golf cart must have a license plate when operated as described in question above. Is that state law or is that one of the That's recommended? the master plan community. Yeah, that's something yeah. completely that's separate. Totally that's totally different. State law. I, I guess what I was reading this, state law says unless it's a master plan community, you have to have a license plate issued by the state. The way this, the way you, you wrote, this, this yeah. number three. Mm -hmm. Looking at the ordinances as far as what I found, 
um, maybe contradicts itself, but I did not find where he's required to be registered with the other ordinances that I looked at. So our state I, law. I will jump in here and just say, by state law, there is no uh, vehicle registration for golf. Correct. And just a reminder, state law treats golf carts, ATVs, neighborhood electric vehicles differently, right? So if we're going to address, and if, if the city wants an ordinance to address those things, then we have to make sure that we pull that out directly from state law for each type of vehicle, because they, they, they are addressed differently. Okay. Correct. So with then with a golf cart specifically that is that is has to have a slow moving does not have to have a registration a utv that can go i mean some of these utv goes 60 miles an hour so a utv that does not have the registration it needs to have the slow moving uh the triangle yeah. or right. not so if, if it's going to be uh, limited to, to driving in certain areas where that speed limit is 25 miles or, or less it must have the requirement Okay, so using a golf cart, a UTV, you have to have, or a tractor, you have to have that triangle line, right? Since the entire Correct. city is of Castroville is 25 mile an hour speed limit, except right. Highway 90, that's anywhere in Castroville. Well, it's also lower the cost. It's 471, right? right. So I, going back, it says your question, answer. I don't know who did the question and answers. With the exception of, op of the operation in certain master plan communities, a golf cart must have a license plate when operated as described in the question above. And the, question, and the question above said, can you, you can use it, unless it's prohibited, you can use it on any street less than 35 miles an hour. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So it's, it's not registered, but it has to have a license plate. Right. right. How do you get a license plate if it's not registered? There's a, it's in here, it, he shows an example, it's to the state, there's a, special license yeah license. there's a website that you interesting okay cool yeah it was just a lot of information I did Correct. read through it but it was just a lot of information so I just wanted to make it a little bit more concise I was surprised I mean there's so many different ones you're calling I think they were called um, I don't know sliders or something I didn't know yeah, what yeah, they the, were the little ones that you go yeah I mean all kinds of different types of vehicles that were in there okay. that, that I just call an ATV and ATV you know and you start getting specific to get the word out to citizens that something the like the back side or the of the newsletter saying did you know right. yeah, these are the rules for yeah <laughs> these are the rules for if you drive around an atv these are the rules if you drive around in the golf cart that way people can see it and understand it yeah i think That's we can put state that law yeah i think that we can put that not on this upcoming one uh but on the one after that i think that would be prudent especially as we're going into the summer the kids know. out of school, oh yeah, they and, go flying uh, down the road in golf carts. And did a QR code for the link to the to the uh, statute. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that would be very well, prudent of us. Okay. Know, uh, wise of us. All right. So, Scott, I'll make sure, I'll take a, an action item on that to add that to newsletter. Yeah, and again, that's not the upcoming newsletter, it's the following yeah, one. No, because we're, we're out of space. In the we're out of space in the current one, right? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I can't during here, but absolutely afterward. Yeah, uh, that's state law. I'm sorry. Are we asking the staff to write an ordinance, or what? What are we asking? That that was my next. Question. Well, that is a question. So, do we want to uh, do we want to take a look at um, what the? Let's do it like this. Um, I, I think it sounds like there is appetite to look at things other than what state law is to regulate for the regulated. So, I think that um, we can do that tonight. Or we can, I think that it would be prudent to put together like each individual and just say these are the areas based on the people that I represent where I feel like we should be addressing some of these things, put those into a list to give to staff then so that they can cover it. That gives them a little bit more um, direction. I'd like to hear direction. from the city administrator, how much time does he think the staff would need to put together a draft ordinance? Mm -hmm. And the ordinance ought to be comprehensive, it ought to cover every different type of vehicle and if we want to make it more stringent than the state law we should put it in a draft and then we can have a discussion because i, mean, I don't want to spend yeah, eight hours thing. going through this texas ordinance writing questions yep. yeah well this, this i think this ordinance and i don't know how the process would move forward just need to review it because right. the city of kyle right. is a home rule city yep. and city this is just a template this right. is a template so that we can turn around and build and tweak for ourselves. Government does it all the time. 
I would suggest that I think I think you were saying this earlier, Councilman Dyer. Like, you've been handed something else. We'll get this to you electronically. That you review this individually. If there's aspects of this that you don't want, I mean, come prepared to talk at a future meeting. Put it on the council mm -hmm. agenda and say, okay, this is what I like from the ordinance. This is what I didn't like. And then, and then we would take that conversation. We'd run it through our attorney and figure out, okay, because they were home rule and we're general law, what can we do versus what they did? I think that's the, the path forward. I support that. Yep. All right. So, so moved. So I, I, I want to say something. Please, I, I don't own an ATV golf cart or anything. I don't plan to. Um, but I can tell you, and I understand what you're saying, I do not like to see the little kids one time at the regional park. In fact, I think I... Maybe it was you, Chief, or something. There was this uh, three little girls in a in an ATV going around the loop at 35 miles an hour, and um, so I, I, I totally disagree with that. I can tell you that I've had many citizens come to me concerned that they they don't want us to outlaw these vehicles on our streets because they see Castroville as this small place community. And they understand that um, it, this is what kind of makes Castroville nice is be, the ability to drive these vehicles. Um, so I think there needs to be a lot of discussion on this. But I totally agree with the state law. Right. But if we make it more stringent, that I think we are going to have a lot of citizens that are going to be upset at us just based on the conversations they've had with me. I think that we need it. I think the baseline, the reason that I wanted to hit what are our current regulations, because the baseline is making sure that we're following, and this is with everything, making right. sure that we're following the ordinances that we have, making sure that we're following the laws that we're having. And so just like with anything else, if somebody sees somebody speeding, um, take down the license plate, call it into the police, same thing with the other ones. But making sure baseline we're taking care of the laws that are already there. Secondarily, if we want to further limit it that, that's why I think it would be good to take this, and if it is... Uh, the recommendation sounds like from staff is to take this one from Kyle and to look it over and pass that by the people that you know and get the, the word out that this is what we're looking at. We'll find out what's legal and we'll come back with a recommendation. I can also provide you the Lakeway one if you okay. would like because it gives through more they're... options and everything yeah. else like that. Yeah. Please. So. Thank you. Uh, so the population yes. Lakeway? Lakeway, it's not very big. Not I've got a... More than 5,000? I don't know. It's not... It's close. All right, I've got a yeah. and question from council just, members. Well, not a, not a question, just a comment, Same something case. along the lines of what Phil said. I would much rather leave golf carts, ATVs, UTVs, whatever, closer to the state regulations and looser, if possible, because I would rather my neighbors choose to drive a golf cart around than their two-ton pickup truck. They can't see my wife over the hood of their pickup truck. An ATV is much smaller, it drives much slower, it weighs a lot less, they have better lines of sight, and they can hear better when they're in there than when they're in their truck. And so I would not want to dissuade them from getting in the golf cart because, oh, well, now I have to go get a license plate and fill out these forms to an extent more than state law requires. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of from a safety perspective, from I have small kids and they run around and sometimes they run in the street and I'd much rather the brakes be squealing on a, a golf cart than F-250. In my previous life we actually negotiated, well FedEx came to us and wanted to use golf carts for delivery during Christmas time and that's what we did. Smaller, safer. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, UPS Shorter, did that a stopping different. Goes right. Here in town. Yeah, I know right. that Amazon has done that in different areas too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, from a safety standpoint, it's a two ton truck against golf cart. Right. The golf cart's going to probably end up in a hospital. Or, uh, right. And it's both sides. I mean, out, and it, it kind of depends on which road that they're on. Absolutely. Right. So, let's, let's uh, send out Lakeway and Kyle. Okay, and I'll send it to. Send it to, uh, let's send it to the city attorney and have her take a look at okay. yes, sir. what is allowable under um, general law. Yes, sir. And we'll get that out to uh, anybody that wants to ask for this for through uh, 
uh, open records. Just email our uh, city secretary. We can get those out. Okay. Are we good with that direction? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Before the Thank chief you. sits Thank down, you. can we talk about stop signs? Yeah, absolutely. He's not done. This is a in, in your in your document. You give the information about stop signs. Uh, I had a conversation with a resident that lives right beside the one you put in on Florence and Geneva, and he told me that they're basically ignoring the stop sign and because it's temporary we can't give out permits or citations, citations. Uh, so I guess uh, my question to you chief and the city is we've had these temporary signs in place for I think uh, over a month I, I think you've got a lot of data from the radar when are you recommending or what are you recommending as to what the timeline should be for making them permanent the way I put in the, the uh, report was my opinion of our last meeting or the meeting that we had about the stop signs were that y'all were in favor of putting the stop signs there permanently. So it would be on y'all's timeline. I just left the one part in there about the state regulation just to keep it in there. But it's ultimately your decision. And we've got people that are saying they're running the stop sign. We have people that are saying they're stopping at the stop sign. Uh, and you are correct. We can't, we can't cite. We cannot cite for that. Uh, if, if I can go back in, and um, I'll go open it up to you in just a second. The reason that we put them up in the first place is because we wanted to make sure that we gave, like, we didn't just start sticking up signs and got massive uh, negative feedback from people. So um, I've heard from people that say they really appreciate having them, and I've heard of people that say that they really don't appreciate having them. I heard one person that came in from our visitor group, he's like, man, you guys got a lot of stop signs. but. This is representing the people that we represent. So well, I've got no, I've got no feedback from anybody except the resident that lives right beside the stop signs, and his his feedback is they're for the most part ignored, right. and until we make them permanent, and then we can issue citations and maybe they'll have an effect. That's the only feedback sure. I have. Well, the the whole reason that we put them out in the first place is it's a stopgap measure to make sure that if somebody if like all of the neighbors around there say we hate having this here then we haven't made something that we have to go back on and spend hundreds of dollars. We put up a sign and we don't. So I think that we bring this back. I think it's easy enough for the next meeting. Or I don't know what the process is, but we go back it'll to the next meeting. Ordinance. Yeah, it'll be an ordinance. We would come back with an ordinance to make those permanent. Yeah, are you wanting to make all the locations permanent? The three. Three that are cited. Yeah, I think you br just bring it back as an ordinance for all three locations and just make sure that you're talking to your constituency. and if. Uh, if the overwhelming response is no, they don't want it, then vote that way. If the overwhelming response is yes, they like it, then vote that way. I think it's easy. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Did you have something else? Okay. All right. Um, did we want to bring up about the court, uh, uh, code violation you're, thing? You're very welcome to. I was waiting to see if you Yes. <laughs> you know me. Um, at last meeting, uh, we brought up how last two meetings. Last two meetings, thank you. Uh, Curl's Not report two, on code violations used to be detailed. That way, we know where the violations were in our district. Not now, we have a report of just what the violation is and how many. Can we go back to that detail? Yes. Thank you. And I think that we need to go back. I think that her detail was good. I still think that even when she was giving that detail, it wasn't enough. Um, it would be really to the detail where we have repeat offenders, especially ones that we have been pursuing, that talks about the actions that we've taken, the actions that we will be taking. So it's, and it doesn't have to be on all of them because I don't think, I think most people will fix it in a short time, but there are some that they've been outstanding for a long time. Yeah. Just so that we see that we are making uh, like specific action. We can ask questions on what else we can do if we need to do more, if we have the legal ability to do more. I think it's getting to those those few outliers that are gross negligence correct to make sure that we can answer to the people that we represent that we are actually doing something okay okay yes sir otherwise thank you for all the hard work you, you and your officers are doing yeah. thank you very much everything that's going on and everything so thank you thank you i have one other comment on the staff report yes, please. with regard to the tourism report yes uh, i'd like to compliment 
the fact that you've given us a good report this month. This is very thorough. And I really appreciate the work that's been put into it, along with the other staff elements. They're all good reports. Thank you. I, I, because you brought it up, you know, one of the things that's, that's I believe we can hang our hat on uh, um, is where the sales tax has increased on 90 specifically. When we do comparisons of Castroville to uh, Bernie or Fredericksburg or some other tourism-centric areas, our our impact on our downtown has been more significant than theirs. You know, we, we've seen a double-digit increase in sales tax revenue over the same time period that those other cities are seeing three, three to six percent. I mean, so I, I think that that I believe that's direct evidence that the the marketing and tourism type stuff that we're doing is is having some dividends. It's not a lot of money. I'm not going to pretend it is, but as far as the actual net increase, it's it's considerable. But we now can't, we we can't glean it without this kind of analysis. Right. right. And that it's really good analysis. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'll pass that along. Great. And the Fenna who stole the... Of welcome. course not. Stole the what? The, the city limit sign? City limit sign down on the, the river road. No, we don't know who stole it. We'll just keep putting yeah. it back until they... If, but it only, made, it only stayed up for like a week? A literally, no, like three days. It was three gone days. very quickly. <laughs> I'm going to blame you because you're the one that wanted that sign put up. I <laughs> need a game. I want it up. We need a game cam. Yeah. So I just have to go somebody. I think they. Yeah. yeah I think they, they may have already replaced it, but I'll, okay. I know that they're working on it. <laughs> okay. We'll put, a, we'll put a game camera on it this time. Yeah. If you really want to. Just have a track. Go take that. Take that too. <laughs> They're like, thank you. <laughs> I have had game canners stolen when we were trying to figure out who's yeah. doing illegal dumping. It but, was kind of sad. But when you put that one back up, I think I've mentioned this to you, but that was in the wrong location. It needs to be close to the Castorville by 100 feet or so. Why? Because it wasn't at the city boundary. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's close enough. Yeah. So I, I've, I've got a question. Uh, the guys the doing the like River Bluff cold. electrical project? Uh, I've had some people ask me, are they going to be removing the old transformers or what are they doing? Because right now they have the new transformer, but the old transformer is still there. Yeah, it'll be. The, yeah. They're taking them out? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, just yeah, yeah, yeah. asking. It's question. another chair. Huh? I'm kidding. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> uh, let's see what else. You can trade it for the city of Castorellas. I think we went to the <laughs> Ricky left. But I know we covered that during it, uh, during the initial presentation. But I don't know what the timeline is. That's a better, not a better, but that's another question that I would want the answer to. So I'll try to get that answer for you. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, also, can you see if whatever they're doing is the reason why none of the night street lights are working? <laughs> At least down to Oh, really? Cat w on which streets? River Trail. The whole way down, all the street lights aren't working. Okay. So I didn't know if they, that's part of their. Very possible that switch, it's on switch that. Switch out. Okay, because okay. I've had some people ask me. <laughs> well, since when? Um, it's been about a week now. Okay. So I, I just thought, you know, but if people are asking me because they like to walk yeah, yeah, at yeah. night and everything. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Safety. Mm -hmm. For sure. <laughs> all right. We got anything else? Packet. Okay. Uh, anything that we have not covered on future agenda items? Well, I want to remind you we have our drainage meeting next Thursday. We have the allocations coming Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, Do we have an ad going in the paper for the uh, twinning and stuff? Yeah, that, no. just that same thing that we're putting out on uh, uh, social media. No, it was in the no. Yeah, we're too. It's too late to get it in this week. Is it? I, it had to be, yeah, it had to be by two o'clock yesterday if okay. we're going to make it by Thursday. It's a large. What's that? Sometimes I can squeeze them in on Tuesday morning if they're not real big, but they're a large. One. Yeah. But by this time, it's definitely. Yeah. It's definitely too late. Paper's already been printed. Gotcha. I think there's uh, the stories you know, right there, and then the Yosemite Festival is ads in the papers. So. Okay. And you're going to give directions to for Sunday night. You go right to where the city of Castroville street limit sign is that yeah. got stolen. Used to be. Bradford's and turn place? right. The old shark place? Turn left. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. what it's uh, It's right behind my house. Oh, gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Roll down the hill. Yeah. Don't roll down the hill. Oh, I'm going to go down my. 
Top no roll on the, there we go. Even with the extra batter, <laughs> we are. I, I used to keep my horses there when the sharks uh, owned it, so I yeah. know they're. I know that Joe did the mudslide. So even with the extra banter, we are through our agenda and adjourned at 7.51. Seven fifty one. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.